Zero Foxtrot does not profess to share or promote the opinions and beliefs expressed by show host or guests. The Stay Zero podcast was created to provide a platform for servicemen and women to share their stories. Due to the nature of this podcast, sensitive topics will arise. Conversations about combat, PTSD, drug use, and other such subjects will occur. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to the Stay Zero podcast. I have Jake Bigelow here with me today. A little disclaimer, we had a technical difficulty with the video, and so there's going to be about half of this just audio. The other half will have video up for you. Um, so hope you enjoy, and thank you for listening. Uh, Jake, man, thanks for coming in. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Um, and so you you were a veteran, right? You did some service. What did you do? Uh, I spent six years in the Air Force and Security Forces. Yeah. Um, nukes most of the time. Oh, yeah. For those that have done it, it's a pretty awful job. Really? It sounds fun. It's not at all. A lot of fire watch. I, I, yeah. You weren't getting so, to shoot them, right? No, no. It's, uh, so I did kind of everything you could do in the missile field. Um, we would post for like five days at a time and missile alert facilities mm -hmm. and you're either flight security control or alarm response. Um, so you're just living out in the, when you say living out in the field, they're just basically like you got the fancy house on the top and then it's, you know, 80 feet below that is the capsules that are, so you've got like secure centers that, that house the capsule crews. Uh -huh. Um, I did nuclear transport, so we did convoys. So that was actually driving them um, back and forth from missile sites to to the base to the weapon storage areas. So that that was a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. It was a lot more dynamic. You were actually transporting nukes. If you were on lead or trail, you were driving sixty miles an hour in up armored Humvees, like you know, three feet from the back or the front of of the transport vehicles. I had some friends, I think, do contracts with that. The DOE, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, they do, they transport from like the Department of Energy transports it to the Air Force. Oh, okay. And then the Air Force covers the security for, for those. But I mean, all in all, it's a pretty awful job. Nobody's ever attacked a nuke in the history of nukes yeah. in the US. A um, little bit of airplane security. So nothing fancy. I actually, for being in the military during, you know, an entire time of war, I didn't get to do anything that I yeah can brag about it all. Um, and then I got out, went into the guard. I went to paramedic school, went into the guard. I was with the dust off unit for, for a few years, um, doing medevac, um, mostly in state stuff, search and rescue, um, Colorado floods, things like that. Nice. And then you became a cop and then right? became a cop after I was a paramedic. Yeah. Yeah. How has that been? You're in Wyoming, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. How's, how's that career change been? Uh, God, I'm between my 11th and 12th year now as a, as a police officer, I did, when did I finish? I think I finished paramedic school in like 2009 and went into law enforcement in, uh, 13. Okay. So I kind of had a short stint. I went to all that time to become a paramedic. It just, it's kind of a, it's a great job, but it's just notoriously underpaid, understaffed. It's just not a, unless you're working for government, Yeah. you know, like fire, a fire system or something like that. It's just very private private EMS just pays like crap. Mm. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. So. For sure. Yeah. I was an EMT basic and a firefighter for a while. And that's why I left. But yeah. I just, I made enough money to be broke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't, I mean, it was fun. Occasionally you do something, right? Like I've got a few experiences as a paramedic where like, I know that I contributed to saving a life, you know, particularly like cardiac arrest and stuff pre-hospital. But for the most part, did you get a CPR save? Uh, I, I couldn't even tell you how many like arrests that you get return, you know, it, like you get return of spontaneous circulation. I, the answer is yes, but it sounds cool. It's just, it becomes part of the job, right? Yeah. Like you're running these codes. We felt like, times a week. I mean, maybe I had a lot, I had a lot of nursing homes in my district. Right? They're usually dead by the time. You yeah. Get there. So yeah. They like Cause if, they didn't call to get one of them back was a big deal. Cause they haven't checked on them in two, two hours. So, <laughs> well, I also felt terrible. Like I, the first guy that I, I, I guess saved dude was 90 years old. Yeah, and yeah. I turned his sternum into a soup bowl. It's like, hard to describe I could what feel. it's like to do CPR on somebody. Yeah. Because the mannequins don't tell you, right? Until you actually start breaking ribs, particularly on older people. Yeah. You feel the thunks, you feel the cracking. And then yeah. by the end of it, I mean, I could almost just 
I could feel his heart. Yeah. Like I could push on it and feel the blood flow out. And I was literally just, oh, well, there is his heart. <laughs> I'm just going to push on that. And and we brought him back and I was a little bit upset and annoyed that he didn't have a DNR. And the family wanted us to do everything we could to say, I'm like, All this the guy's time. fucking 90 yeah. years old. There's not a happy ending here. He's going to struggle and and breathe in severe pain until his sternum either heals up or he dies a second time. Right. And that's what happened was he lived about three months, died a second time. And then the family was okay to say, Oh, let him go. I was like, you fucking assholes. <laughs> I, I think, I think what you see with that a lot is you do it even as cops, right? You show up on scene first all the time for EMS stuff and you do CPR and it's kind of a running joke because I was a paramedic, like mm -hmm. cop does CPR yeah. person makes it to the hospital and they live for 12 hours and then they die. And then the cop gets like a, a life saving ribbon. Right. Right. Um, but I'm looking at that from a jaded perspective. Like you didn't save a life. You prolonged it. Right? Mm -hmm. But the answer is there is value in that. Yeah. Right. You, you prolong the life of somebody who has died suddenly and family has no opportunity to accept it, own it, deal with it. Yeah. So if you prolong the life, at least they get to the hospital and family has an opportunity to, in a more controlled setting, say goodbye, spend time with the loved one while they're still alive. So I think there is value in that. Get right? some closure. That you get a little closure. So you're creating, you're creating closure. I like that. I think that's the difference there. But having been a paramedic, it's like, I don't know, 99 out of a hundred calls you run as a paramedic if they would have gotten in a taxi cab yeah. and driven to the hospital, the outcome would have been the same. Mm -hmm. It's that 1%. Like I pulled a steak out of a dude's trachea one time. He choked, he was drunk, choked on steak. When I got on scene, he was unresponsive. They were getting ready to start CPR. And I used direct laryngoscopy and McGill's to pull the steak out of his, it was sitting, it was literally in his vocal cords. Wow. And pulled it out. And then we got him back. And by the time we get to the hospital, he's awake, talking, thanking us, you know? So like that, those are the ones that stick with you. Like if it wasn't for me showing up on scene, because when I showed up, I was the only person on scene who had the scope mm -hmm. to do that. Right. Everybody else on scene could have only done the so Heimlich much. Whatever, right. Yeah. But I had the ability to do direct laryngoscopy. And so that one, you know, that's cool. Like, Hey, were it not for me? And then being a part of a team doing, you know, cardiac arrest saves on 50 guy, you know, 50 year old guy who, goes into cardiac arrest, you know, you get him back and then he lives and, you know, he comes back to say thank you. Like that yeah. stuff. That's cool. Those are good moments. Those are the good moments, but there's not, there's not a lot of those in EMS. Yeah. I, think. I enjoyed the EMS side more than the fire side because of, you know, you're helping people and each one is kind of a, it's a little puzzle. It's an enigma. What's going on with this person? You know, right. Learning to diagnose in the field, kind of what you think and then yeah. treat them and then find out you were right. feels good. Well, and the difference too, like you talk to guys that were medics in combat versus medics in the field. I mean, I worked with guys that were combat medics mm -hmm. in, you know, infantry units actually dealing with casualties versus pre-hospital care in the U S yeah, that's a whole different deal. 99% of our calls are medical related there. You're dealing with actual limb amputations and major traumatic injuries on healthy dudes and on your buddy, on your buddy, right? right. Like that's, a, that's a whole different very personal. I, yeah. Couldn't even, couldn't even fathom that even as uh, doing medevac, it's the same concept, right? You pick somebody up, but you don't know them. Yeah. Whereas if you're actually with a unit, it's different. So yeah, man, but I'll tell you those combat medics, man, like they could work the trauma. That's for sure. I bet that's their, that's their wheelhouse. Send them to a nursing home to deal with grandma having a COPD exacerbation. They're like, eh, but and that was ultimately, I think, why I ended up leaving is we had five nursing homes and I spent more time picking grandmas up off the ground because the oh, yeah. staff would punt liability to EMS. All the time. Call yeah. EMS. Call EMS. Yep. It's not my patient. Yep. I just checked. Yep. It, ju it just got old. And I, I knew I wanted to go into law enforcement. I'd always wanted to do it beforehand. I joined the military thinking I was going to be a cop, mm -hmm. security forces in the Air Force. I ended up on the security side. So all I did was security. I never really did anything law enforcement related. It's probably better. We, those guys are just blue falcons. Yeah. I'm glad in hindsight that <laughs> I didn't You don't want to do go that. around arresting work Working at a shack. Like, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, no thanks. That. Fuck that. And so you've been, you're, you're a policeman in Wyoming now, right? Yeah. And you've had a couple of incidents, right? Yeah. Black cloud. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the... Yeah, you got what you asked one. for after yeah. a while. Yeah. Um, talk to me. Which one do you want to cover first? Uh, well, I mean, I guess, you know, the shoot, it's, so two shootings. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about that. The, those ones aren't as, I think everybody thinks like the poor cop had to get into a shooting and that's the most traumatic thing that a cop deals with. The truth is the, the shootings themselves weren't overly traumatic. 
I mean, you don't, you don't go into law enforcement wanting it. It's, it's all the other stuff, right? Like, I think I talked to you on the phone previously. Um, like I've got that one, that one incident that I don't particularly talk about with yeah. anybody or I don't, if I do talk about it, I've kind of got the safe version of it. Yeah. Um, that that's like that skeleton in the closet. That's the traumatic one. And it was not a shooting, right? Mm. It's a crash with a kid. So like, those are the things that are hard. The shootings themselves you can talk about. Um, were you a father when that happened? Yeah. Is that, yeah, that's the relationship. Yeah. And my daughter was pretty close to the same age. So. That's, yeah, that's super tough. Yeah. Those, that one's, that's the one that kind of like started this downward spiral into like having to acknowledge that there was a mental health issue. So really, but the other, sh the, the shootings, well, traumatic in their own way. Like, I don't know. That's, that's kind of what I expected as a cop. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like protect other people, be violent if you have to. You just don't expect the other stuff, dead kids, right? Um, yeah. Taking kids away from parents because they can't stop smoking meth, things like that. Wow. Those are the things that start to bother you, I think, after a while. Yeah. And you hear Wyoming and you think, oh, it's just. It's a bunch of rednecks. It's antelopes right? What's and rednecks. Yeah, right? a bunch but of hunters. Where I work at is extremely violent. A lot of drugs, um, a lot of property crime, a lot of homelessness, um, which is weird because it's centrally located and then it's nothing but. Yeah, I wouldn't expect Pristine anyone wilderness. to survive in Wyoming without a home. I don't know how. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Every year, it got 50 below zero this year without wind chill. I think this year it hit 47 below zero without wind chill Jeez. this year for, for a couple of days. And I, I just, I don't know how we yeah. don't have more homeless people die from exposure every year. Me either. It's crazy. And <laughs> so, but I mean, Casper's got a ton of, ton of drugs, ton of fentanyl, meth, um, Everybody's got guns, right? It's just, it's, so it's like, it's a gun culture. So because it's a gun culture, like for example, in Wyoming, you can be a felon in possession of firearms. It's not illegal to be a felon and have a firearm in Wyoming, unless you're a violent felon. Well, you know, I feel if, if you committed, and there's a lot of felonies on the books, right? If you commit a felony and you serve your sentence, once that's over, I think you should be, you should have your rights back. Right. You know, you should have, you should be able to vote again. You shouldn't be completely estranged from society for the rest of your life. And I, I agree. I, uh, I think that like, listen, you, uh, you commit fraud, let's say when you're mm -hmm. 25 years old, right. And, uh, and you get convicted of a felony and you do your sentence. Does that mean that for the rest of your life, you shouldn't be allowed to vote, shouldn't be able to own firearms, you shouldn't be able to hunt, you shouldn't be able to do it? Like, I, dis I would completely right. disagree. I think, and, and I agree with Wyoming in what their law is, and it's for that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure how I feel about the idea of repeat drug offenders who are felons having the same rights as everybody else because drug addiction versus distribution, but everybody who I worked with, as a, so I worked narcotics for, for several years. Um, everybody who uses distributes in some way. Yeah. Always. Rather, At least to their buddies. Hey, man, to their buddies. Well, they don't want to admit it. They don't want to admit it, right? They're not bringing five pounds in mm -hmm. and then distributing five pounds. They're not making trips to Denver, Colorado to get pounds and bring it back. What they are doing is they're saying, I'm going to get this and then I'm going to sell it to this few people so I can stay high and then I have enough money to go get more. Mm. Or you call me and you say, hey, do you know where I can get some? And I'm like, yeah, man, I've got a connect. I'll hook you up. Then I go to that connect. And in return for me hooking you up, I get a little bit, mm. right? That person in the middle never wants to acknowledge that they're distributing, yeah. but they are, right? So the distributor versus the user who's trying to stay high, like there's this. Yeah, there's it's this a complex conundrum. thing to go down. And it's probably why they just laid a blanket rule because you can, you know, dissect it as deep as you want like well this one he should and this one he shouldn't if it's violent crime then it's a no right. if it's you know whatever where i get frustrated with it is we make this we make the arrest on a person who's a felon and they're a drug felon mm -hmm. okay um they've got dozens of misdemeanor drug charges a couple felony drug charges um and now i have them with more drugs and they also have a gun I can't do anything about the gun. I can take the gun, but there's no charge. Even though they're a felon, even though they're in possession of drugs, I can't do anything about it. So then I'm left with having to forward that stuff to the feds because then the feds have the ability to deal with the felon in possession, the furtherance of a drug crime. Um, that's kind of that. Hmm, like you're not, a, you didn't get charged with a felony 10, 15 years ago and now you're living an upstanding life. You're continuing to be a piece of shit. Yeah. And hurt our community yeah. and, and bring drugs into our community. No doubt he's still on probation. And like still, yeah. on probation, you don't need a gun. 
Right. And the only reason you're carrying a gun isn't because you want to be a law abiding citizen to defend yourself or to go hunt. You're carrying it to protect your drugs. You're dealing drugs. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. what you're doing. So like that person doesn't need a gun. Yeah. He's using it in that capacity to continually break the law. Right. right. So what I'd like to see Wyoming do is, is create laws that say drugs and guns together is its own charge. Mm. Right. That's what I would like to see. Mm. But, but uh, Wyoming in, in is a good thing in that it protects its residents from what they believe to be overreaching governmental laws regarding guns and um, protecting people in that capacity. And like, I don't believe that we should be treading on the rights of good people yeah. at the expense of safety, right? Or the argument being safety. So walk me through uh, what happened that day on the, the video that went viral that, yeah. that you had to shoot somebody. Um, I, so I, I like to, I call it doing hood rat things. I like to go out and find um, so I'm not, I don't, I don't make traffic stops. Like I don't see soccer mom doing six over in a school zone and then go, oh, man, that's it. Like, we're going to go save the world right now. Get that bitch. Get her, get that, <laughs> get her stopped and make her late to work, dropping her kid off and write her a ticket and make her pay for that. Right yeah. now I get it. I mean, all the traffic cops out there listening to this will be like, but that's a safety. It. I agree. You're just never going to convince me that I'm saving the world one seven mile an hour over the speed limit ticket at a time. Yeah. I'm just not going to happen. So I look for behavior. We were talking about the book, What Everybody Knows. Mm, behavior. Book. Joe Navarro. Joe Navarro. My buddy Craig Meyer is a cop in Bryan, Texas. He teaches a class, literally the best class in the history of policing, in my opinion. I think you're going to try to get him on the show. Yeah. Um, every cop in the nation should go through that class, in my opinion. Um, it's looking for that behavior, right? That limbic system response, that sympathetic nervous system response. When you're driving past a cop and you're speeding, what do you do? You go, oh, shit, I'm speeding. And then like, oh, is he going to pull me over? But you go on about your day. Like it doesn't create fight or flight. You don't go into panic mode. You don't get hypervigilant. You don't, you know, it's your, your world's not coming crashing down. But that person who drives by with warrants, you know, guns, drugs, those people exhibit behavior the same as if you were walking, you know, walking out in the forest and you walk up on a bear, right? Like you're going to, you're going to react the same way to a bear that might kill you as you would if you see a cop and you're yeah. committing crime, it's going to put you in prison. So that's the behavior you're talking about. So that's the behavior that I look for. And I was training a guy. He just, he was on his last day of training. Actually, we were just getting ready to kick him loose. And he had asked, could we go out and like. Do hood rat shit. Do with hood our rat shit with our friends, right? <laughs> um, and I'm like, let's go do it. So we set up in a kind of a high crime area in town um, and just started watching cars drive by. And what I was explaining is like, hey, do you see them? They didn't care we were there. No reaction whatsoever. Car drives by, no reaction that's not the car we're looking for. And he's like, no license plate light or they're missing a headlight. And I'm like, don't care. That's not the violation. I care about the behavior. The violation we use for the stop later, mm -hmm. but the behavior is what gets us our, our attention. So car drives by, dude in the front seat, driving, hood up, lean back in the car, dude in the passenger seat, as soon as he sees us, sinks down in the seat, hood up, hides back behind the B pillar, mm -hmm. right? It's you see it. It's, it's that, it's that blocking. Yeah. If I don't see him, he can't see me. Yep. Um, the car kind of lurches cause you get that limbic like freeze. Do I keep driving? Um, and I said, and I'm like, and he's, and, and actually the cool thing is he's like that. And I'm like that, that's what we're looking for. So as they go by, there's no license plate light. So there's a violation, right? We have a violation of the state statute. I now have behavior associated with limbic system activation. They are terrified of us. Mm -hmm. So we pull out, they make that quick turn onto a side street, which is again, distancing. If we turn, they won't follow us. So we turn, yep. start following them. And then they pull over before they even get stopped. That's that self-stopping behavior. If you get Craig on the show, he could. He could tell you all about that stuff, but I'm, I've talked to him and I think we are going to try to get him yeah. in a very interesting guy. Oh, it's incredible stuff. So they self stop Well, they're hoping that if they pull over, we'll think they're in front of their house and we'll just drive past them. Right. Absolutely not. So I said, light them up, pull in. And so it starts as a traffic stop, walk up to the window. He's training. So I have, he, he goes up to the driver's side. Um, and I won't get into the whole training component. There's some things like breaking contact and stuff that I wouldn't have wanted him to do. Yeah. Um, but I'm talking to the passenger who is buried in his phone, tucked back behind the beep. Like I know immediately that this dude doesn't want me there and he's trying to self soothe. He's trying to hide from me. The, the driver, when I start talking to the passenger, the driver's questioning why I'm talking to his passenger, all of the things associated with like trying to intimidate you from not doing your job. Yeah. I could tell immediately the passenger gave a fake name. When he, when he gave his name to the, to my partner who was training, 
I just, I've done it enough to know that the words that came out of his mouth were bullshit. He lied immediately, but you don't confront that behavior in the car, right? I don't go, ah, you just lied, right? You want them to think that you're buying off on their bullshit until you can stack the deck and get it figured out. So he goes back to the car, which is where I'm talking about. Like, I don't break contact at that point. We should have just called for more units, start getting people out of the car. Right. Um, but he breaks contact. I keep typing or talking to the driver and or to the passenger. And at some point in there, and if you watch the video, at some point in there, he rolls the window up on me, starts demanding a sergeant. That's that intimidation stuff. So I ask him to step out of the car and then he talks to the driver and he says something to him. And I, and what I found out later is he was telling him, Hey, take off, drive away, run. And the driver's like, I'm not running. I don't want, I don't, I don't want any part of that. So then the driver tells him, I'm going to get out of the car. You can do whatever the fuck you want to do. So the driver bails out of the car. And when he does that. I don't know what he's doing, but he jumps out of the car and starts moving back towards my partner who's in the car and in, in the police car. So I immediately pulled my gun and started to meet him, right? I was going to come back and meet him there. Like, I don't know what he's doing because I lost sight of him. And as I come around the backside, I start confronting him and he says, I don't want anything to do with this, right? He's hands up. I don't want anything to do with it. And then I see the passenger start to, and he's like 350 pound dude, start trying to climb into the driver's seat. So this is where. Shouldn't have had that cheeseburger. Yeah. <laughs> so I see him climbing into the driver's seat. So I run back over and I get the door open. And this is the, I've always told myself I would never go into a vehicle that was getting ready to flee. Right. But this one's different now. This isn't the driver of the vehicle trying to flee. This isn't me jumping through the driver window yeah. on a car that's fleeing. This is the passenger. So it's that Jack Russell instinct to like go after him. So I reach in and I'm trying to pull him backwards because I know what he's trying to do. Yeah. I'm trying to pull him but I can't, you're not going to win that battle. 350 pounds. He's got leverage. He's pulling. I'm trying to pull back. And before I know it, he ends up in the driver's seat of the car. And as he gets into the driver's seat of the car, he starts trying to put it in drive. And then I realized I'm fucked. Like at that point I knew you're in the passenger I, seat I am, now. I am completely in the car now at this point. Like mm -hmm. now I am up on my knees. One, well, one foot on like the floorboard and then my left knee up on there. And I've, I realized afterwards that I've got, I don't know how I did it, but I had flashlight in my left hand and I pulled my gun with my right hand and I'm doing all of this with a flashlight and a gun still, hey. um, even though I've got a light on my gun. It just, I didn't transition the drop, doing, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm doing this with both hands. So I see him go after the, the gear shifter and I, and I, that's when I start telling him, if you put this in drive or if you, if you drive away with me, something like that, I will fucking kill you, right? We're not being nice at this point. I will fucking kill you if you drive away with me. Um, and he gets it into drive and takes off. And I remember the, I remember thinking as soon as he took off that the door was still open. I thought I was going to fall out and I don't know how, I, I don't know if I closed the door. I on to this day. I don't know if I closed the door or if the door closed itself or if I got my foot out of the way, but the door got closed. And I remember that like fleeting thought. That's like, well, at least the door's closed. I won't fall out. And then it's just back and forth to this dude while I'm yelling at him. And it's, it's screaming at him that I will fucking kill him if he doesn't stop. And he has no reaction to it. It just doesn't give a shit at all, right? I can see it. It doesn't care. And at one point he says, shoot me. And I didn't hear it or it didn't click. And I said it again and he said, shoot me then. So it's uh, it like, and that's, and there's a period in that video where I stop. He says that the second time and I stop. I'm not screaming anymore, right? At that point, I'm uh, amped up. I will fucking kill you. I will fucking kill you. Stop the car. I will fucking kill you. And he said that and it clicked immediately. I was like, I'm fucking dead. Like I'm dead. There's no way I get out of this. What they, is it that you thought he was going to do? I thought. Or what I, were you what were you afraid that he was going to do? How you were going to wind up dead? Uh, I thought we were going to crash. Yeah. Like he was going to crash the car. Um, I didn't know. I knew we were going. I know the direction that we we're traveling, which goes to an interstate. Mm -hmm. And that is literally the only place it goes is the interstate. Um, I just I like I don't I didn't. I knew that I was going to get killed. I just didn't like, I knew we were going to crash or I just knew I was fucked. That's the, I mean, that's the only way I can think about it is I'm fucked. But when he said the second time, just shoot me then I would just been, I have a gun in his face. I've told him I'm going to fucking kill him. I dozen times at least at this point. And when he just said, shoot me then like, that's where it changed for me. Like I knew immediately there that this was no longer a guy that was scared trying to run and maybe that that 15 20 seconds was like the time he needed to be like wait that was really stupid i'll stop the car i knew at that moment i was fucked yeah there wasn't any rationalizing there was no rational ne negotiating dude, with him no that dude was gonna die he was gonna kill me he was gonna kill himself or he was gonna kill us both that was it there was or he was gonna get away like that was it those were the he there were no other options 
So he said that and I went quiet. Like there's a period where I completely deescalate and I'm quiet and it just, it's dead silent for a second or two. And then I remember in a completely calm voice going, dude, what are you doing? Right? Like, it's just, it's such a change. And I didn't do that on purpose. I don't know how to describe that, but there wasn't, it wasn't a purposeful deescalation. Yeah. I was amped up. And then all of a sudden I was like, I'm fucked. And it was almost like, I think the way that I described it, it was almost like acceptance. I, I don't know, stupid as that sounds, it was almost like I'm fucked. I'm not going to like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get killed. I'm not going to go out fucking screaming. Like, I, I don't know how weird that is. It's just like, I'm not going to go out screaming and begging for him to stop this car. So yeah, whatever. And I don't know how or what triggered that. And he made a turn and I don't know if this happened before or after the turn, but he had turned and I remember him turning and it threw me up against the door. And what he was doing was he jumped a curb and went through a parking lot off the curb, off the, through a side street or a frontage road over uh, a ditch or I guess a little median that's the on-ramp to the interstate and then over the other side of that and then ended up on the interstate. So now we're driving southbound in the northbound lanes of the interstate. Um, I, I didn't know this though, because I, I, I still hadn't looked up. I was still looking at him. Um, but I, I was the whole time I was trying to fight the gear shifter, right? I could, the, the video that went online, um, there's like, I don't know, fucking 5,000 comments or something. And like a masochist, I read them all. I don't, I don't know why. That. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you what's funny though, is, is out of like the 5,000 <laughs> comments on there, 99% of them are like, fuck that guy. Uh, that guy got what he deserved. There's a few, there's a few that are like that fucking cop only got in the car to kill a guy and all the other dumb shit that people say. Um, and then there's a few that are like idiot cops shouldn't have been in the car. And I'm like, I'm going to like that one. Like agreed. Yeah. Right. But, but for the most part, everybody's like, that was pretty stupid. And then as morbid as this sounds, there's a couple of funny ones. Like one dude's like, I'm going to run the, I'm going to run from what did it say. It says, I'm going to run from the cops with the cop in the car. Hashtag dead guy. Right. Like I was like, that's kind of funny. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. It's so there's a couple that I, you know, cause we make fun of it and it's in its own way. It's that's what you have to do is yeah, the internet. It. It's got everything. It's I love <laughs> it. so I don't know what trick, but we get over there and like the bumps or something. Cause he's hovering. This dude's like 350 pounds and he's laying over the top of this gear shifter driving to keep me from getting it into to park. And, uh, he, I think the bumps make him come off of for a second. I was able to reach down and push it into park. And when I did the transmission, like, cause it's an older car, it's like a 94 blazer or something like that. Mm. And it, so I heard the transmission get destroyed when I put it into park, but, and then I could hear he was, he had the gas floats. So you could hear the engine up, but we weren't moving forward anymore. Now we were coasting. Yeah. So in that second, I was like, okay, maybe I'm not going to die. Right. I got it in the park and I even knew in that split second that when I, based on what I heard, even if he put it back in drive, the transmission's fucked. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're not going anywhere. You're at least not going fast. We're not going fast anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but as soon as I got it in park, he knew that the engine was destroyed too. Cause his whole demeanor changed. Um, and when that happened, I start screaming at him again. Right. So now I'm back up and he's got a black bag in the back, right between the two seats. And as soon as I did that, he starts reaching back and digging in that bag and then if you watch the video you can hear me start screaming and quit yeah, reaching I did. these fucking idiots on the internet are like oh the cop's screaming quit reaching he's only saying that to justify shooting him okay fuck face well you, like come on yeah. you weren't in the car were you like like the dude reached into a black bag and he pulled out he pulled out a it ended up being a silver butane torch like a like a tweaker torch you know what i'm talking about yeah but it looked like a gun the way he was pulling it out and later just so we can you know for the anybody who wants to say i only said that he did have a gun in the car it was a highly accurate replica like 357 magnum that's what he was trying to get he mm -hmm. wasn't trying to get the torch he yeah. grabbed the first thing that he could get out of the bag he was going to force me to shoot him like that's what was happening um but i didn't know it at the time so we pulled that out and as he came up with it i could see it and i i was i was still yelling quit fucking reaching quit reaching quit reaching and as he came out of it with that i could see the silver on that torch come up and that's when i leaned forward and shot him four times and it was it, as morbid as this sounds to i've had people ask us a thousand times why didn't you shoot him in the side of the face and i don't know the answer to that other than i thought in that split second shooting him in the face would look bad i know that sounds fucked up but it's like if i shot him in the face i was executing him yeah if i shot him in the chest i was stopping him yeah 
And the fact that I even had to have that mindset or that thought in that moment is insane to me, but that's where we're at. It is. So perception's a big deal. I, 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 I specifically considered shooting him in the head and I didn't because I was worried about how it would look. I, and I had a second shooting where I had that same exact same thought. Wow. Um, so I leaned forward when I did, cause I wanted to get, cause he had turned like this. So I'd leaned forward cause I, I didn't want to shoot him at an angle. I wanted to, I wanted to shoot him into the chest. So I leaned forward and I shot four times in the first two rounds. And I remember him folding. So the first, I should see the rounds hit his shirt. I saw the rounds hit his shirt. And when he did, he folded forward. And then the third round hit him in the shoulder. And then the fourth round hit him in the back of the neck. But it was just, it was pop, 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 pop. It was that fast. Mm. Um, and when he did, when I fired the four rounds, he immediately folded and went to the side. And then I, I knew immediately he was dead, right? Because he, he went into the, uh, like, the death rattles, right? Yeah. He, he grunted, he started leaning forward, and then I could see him slowly. It, it's fucked up as it sounds. I could see him dying in that moment. I could, I was watching him die. And as he died, he was falling onto me and I was holding him. Now I was holding him off of me. And that's the first time I looked up and saw that we were on the interstate. I didn't know we were on the interstate yet. So after I shot him, he started slumping onto me and I was holding him up. And I saw that we were on the interstate and I reached over and I took the steering wheel and I pushed it to the to the left. And I don't, we were probably going 20 or 30 miles an hour at this point. And we went off the inner, at that point, I'm like, I got to get off the interstate before we get hit hot on. So we went off the interstate into this deal, into a fence and ran this fence up to this pole and then stopped on the pole. And, uh, that's when I'd got on the radio and started yelling shots fired and where I was at. And, and then in that split second, I knew I'd shot him. So I was requesting EMS, which again, like the morbid side of me is I don't give a shit about this dude. Right. But I know that I got to call for an ambulance. Sure. Because I still have an obligation to care for the person I just shot. That, that, that That's the difference. There is, I still have to provide treatment. I can't just shoot the guy and be like, well, go fuck yourself. Yeah. So um, I called for EMS and I've never been so happy in my life to see my partner who I, I call him a partner at this point because he was a trainee, but he was on his last day. And this dude had left the, the guy who jumped out of the car. He had the, he had the, the common sense to say, screw this guy, gotten his, gotten our car and chased us. Yeah. And he was a little bit behind, but as I was getting out of the car, I see him pulling up behind me and I was like, like you pass. Yeah. You know, yeah. You've passed training at this point. So, you know, I, I, I yelled at him to help me get the dude out of the car. We got him out of the car. This, this is morbid too, but he was dressed when all this happened. But in the process of trying to pull this 350 pound fat dude out of the car, we stripped him on accident. Like when we were pulling on, we were pulling on clothes. He ended up with no shirt on, his pants were down. So I just remember all of a sudden we get him out of the car and other cops start showing up and they start doing CPR on him. And I looked over and he's naked. And I'm like, how the fuck did this guy end up naked? And it's just in the process of pulling him, he ended up naked. Just out of habit, right? But, but I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, just, <laughs> just stripping dudes. Just normally pull guys' clothes just, off. I just rip <laughs> clothes off na unconscious dudes. You know, that's how I operate. So, I, and, then, and then it was just sitting there. And that was, that was pretty, that one was a little different because then I was sitting there watching all of this go down. So like, cop shows up, cop shows up, cop shows up, more cops show up, sergeant shows up, ambulance shows up, fire truck shows up. They're working and working him. And I'm still just sitting there leaning against the hood. Like, and I remember, I wish they hadn't released it, but my department released like five minutes or something like that after the shooting of me sitting there. Mm. And I, I don't like that because that's a pretty, that's a pretty dangerous moment. I think for a cop mm -hmm. because your adrenaline's pumping and you're just wanting to like anybody who will listen, you're wanting to kind of talk to. Sure. Um, and organize I, you know, your thoughts. Right. Talk organize about what my happened, thoughts. Maybe, you know, at least process it with someone else that might understand. Right. Right. And what I don't like about but that. But that is, goes into court. <laughs> there's a body camera on. Yeah. Okay. So they released that. And my chief, you know, don't always agree with him, but he did have that conversation with me and say, I'm going to release this. What was what, his what justification for releasing? Transparency. Five minutes after they wanted to show the human side of that incident, because I think if you watch the video, if you listen to me for the five minutes after the shooting, there is a human yeah. there, right? Like you can tell that I'm talking about it and I'm amped up and then I'm like, he wouldn't fucking stop the car. There's a human component to that, right? I'm amped up. You can hear me breathing hard, um, trying to bring myself back down. So there's, there's a human side of it. Mm -hmm. 
I don't, I see both sides showing that to the general public acknowledges the, like the human side of what just happened. Yeah. Um, but for me, that was a pretty personal thing to release. So I can, un I think I understand both sides of that too. I like, can see both. That's sides. a very personal moment for you to, to deal with and manage. But if you did it in a, in a positive way, in a very real way, real way, it could have great value with public relations. Like, cause the, right now half the world's on standby mm -hmm. to crucify any officer that ever yeah. uses lethal force. And so if you can demonstrate like, Hey, these guys are, are people too. They're not wanting to run out and murder people, but that is part of the job sometimes where they do have to defend their lives with lethal right. force and it does have an effect. Um, so I would assume you handled that in a, in a way that the department was proud of. You know, I think so. Like we, we did have some conversations with that later, you know, and in, like I said, I don't always agree with, with my chief. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I think his decision to, to release that wasn't a, a easy one. Mm. I think he made a decision that he thought was best. So I don't, I'm not mad at him for that at all. Yeah. It sounds like it wasn't malicious. Like he wasn't was trying malicious. to throw There's you under the bus. He was, he was more or less like, <laughs> Hey, they need to see that right. this guy. It's really easy for people to point fingers at the chief and say, this guy doesn't care. Right. And that's, I think that's, it doesn't get you anywhere. Mm. Um, honestly, and even if like, I would want to have this conversation in a way that if he watched the podcast, I'd be okay with it. Yeah. Right. Um, really the only thing that I disagreed with from any perspective of this um, was a conversation that the chief and I had a couple of days after the shooting where he had said, <clears throat> he kind of questioned what I said to the guy and when I said it. And again, I don't think he was being malicious, but he had said something to the effect of, yeah, there's a lot like you telling him you're going to fucking kill him where we might catch a little flack for that. Okay. And then he had said, you threatened to kill him before he even tried to drive away with you. Um, and I said, that's not accurate. I never, I never said a word about shooting him or killing him until he was actively trying to put the car and drive with me in it. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's, and he's like, oh, I'm pretty sure. Right. He was very convinced that I had said that beforehand. Um, and I didn't get to see the body camera footage for probably a month after this incident. They locked it down immediately. Um, and I didn't get to see it for almost a month. So I remember that stuck with me. Like if I'd been able to see it immediately, it probably wouldn't have, but that stuck with me for a month because then I'm like, well, what if, what if, what if, what sure, if? Yeah. Um, and then when I watched the footage for the first time, I didn't give a shit about anything other than that fucking statement. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I watched it and I was like, nope, I, as soon as he starts to put it in drive and drive away with me, that's when I said, if you drive away with me, I will fucking kill you. And I immediately told him. I did not say that when you said I did. And, it, and he basically was like, oh, okay. It was no big deal to him. Yeah. Right. I don't think again, not malicious. I don't think he understands or understood at the time and maybe doesn't understand now. Maybe he'll watch the podcast. Um, how adversely that fucking statement affected me and how long I dwelled on that statement. And I still several years after the shooting, when I teach this stuff to other people, if I have an opportunity to teach, to speak to chiefs, sheriffs, captains, I use this as an example and say, you will fucking ruin somebody by making statements off the cuff that you shouldn't make. Yeah. You you are better off keeping your mouth shut and your opinions to yourself until you're in a position to do it and have all the information. Yeah, position of knowledge, right? Like because he made that statement sure. and he did not do it maliciously and I'm not mad at him for it. Um but it was a very negative like that's the strongest opinion I have on this whole thing was that statement. Mm. What um, was that month like? Um, were you no. on admin leave? Yeah, you so weren't working. Leave. You're just sitting at home. You've done that and you've got all the time in the day to think about it. Unfortunately, it was my second officer involved shooting. So that was the second time I'd gone through that. So it wasn't really anything different for me. You're like, VK. Yeah. The hardest part. Cause the mail. Yeah. <laughs> the hardest part about that shit is you get into a shooting. Everybody wants to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to text you, call you talk to you, people you don't talk to, people that don't care about, I mean, this sounds bad, but like I, I work with 117 other cops, right? Yeah. I talk to most of them at work occasionally. Otherwise I don't know their wives' names. I don't know their kids. I don't know what church they go to. I don't know what they, we're not friends. We're acquaintances. We're coworkers. I have a few that are friends and it's not that they're bad people. It's just, I don't know anything about them. Um, they don't call me to see how I'm doing. They don't check in on me. They don't want to, anything to do with me. And then all of a sudden I get in a shooting and all of a sudden, oh, I better text Bigelow, make sure he's okay. Right. And that's kind of a double-edged sword because at one point 
I'm like, well, I can see why you'd want to check in. Hey, I know we're not really friends. I don't want to hang out, but I want to make sure you're okay. But on the other side, I'm like, I'm tired of being bothered, particularly by people who couldn't be bothered yeah. to talk to me at other times. Yeah. It feels disingenuous. It does. It does. And it's not, and this isn't negative against those people, but by the time I'm on my 75th text message in the, in 24 hours after the shooting, I just, I'm over it. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing I teach to other cops too, is like, you can expect this. If you get into a shooting, you are going to get inundated. So not just from your department, but I mean, I'm sure once that video went out, mm-hmm. did you have social media at the time? Yeah. How did that go? No, nah, I, I, I will be honest. Both of mine, I got pretty lucky on, um, they were both pretty clearly justified in a way that other people, even shitheads were like, yeah, I can see why that dude got shot. Yeah. So I got pretty lucky. Unlike some of my coworkers who have been in OISs, they got crucified even though they were justified. Really? Yeah. So I, I think I got lucky. I didn't get sued civilly on either one of mine. Um, I had families from both people reach out and apologize that I had to do that. Right. So I got, I got a whole different experience. Yeah. Whereas you got the 1980 cop shooting person experience. Yeah. I feel like the, that's I've got not guys that I work today. with literally they got sued. You've got family coming yeah. after them. There's federal lawsuits. They're, you know, they're calling them murderers. I, uh, so I, I got a different experience from the public, mm. so to speak. Right. So that's like the sister of the most recent OIS actually sent me a letter saying that it, it took about a year afterwards. She said it, she had to sit on it for about a year, but it took her a long time to figure out what her feelings were. And now she wanted to reach out to me and essentially said like, our family forgives you. Like, you know what I mean? Kind of one of those things. So for me to get that letter, it, that shit's tough. Like that's. Yeah. What was that like to read that letter and to I like, don't, realize I don't who it was from? I don't know. I don't know what it's because you, you distance everything emotionally. Right. So you're, you read that letter and you're like, I don't know how to describe it, but it's kind of like you're getting this letter from the family and they're like, Hey, this guy was a bad dude. We knew that he was going to end up dead. We knew that it was probably going to be police that did it. Um, we forgive you. We're, we're, you know, we're sorry you had to go through that. So I like that letter. I read it. I let, Another person read it, a good buddy of mine. Um, and then I and then I threw it in a shred box. And then I kind of just struck it. Actually, I haven't even really talked about it until now. But like, so that stuff was weird. Um, and then that same one, um, there's a defense attorney in Casper who was his attorney. And he reached out to me. And I know him personally. I could do judo with him and stuff. He's a um, good dude. But he reached out to me and said, hey, I'm calling you on behalf of his family now that he's no longer my client. They wanted me to let you know and this was like within probably a week or so, like they're super sorry that that happened and we're really glad that you're okay. And right. So I had a different experience, right? I've got family reaching out almost immediately, but then I think the hard part there is I learned after that pretty quickly after that, that he had five kids. Right. So it's like, you know, it humanizes the shit. It does. So now I know he's got kids. Now I know who his ex-wife is. Now I know who his baby mamas are now. I'm getting called by his parents. I'm not called, but like, contacted contacted through through did you respond at all to any of their contact not to them specifically i told the attorney i was like well let them know i said it. i appreciate it but like that's i just pushed that off yeah that's a difficult bridge to to cross yeah i didn't really i don't do emotion super well Mm. that's been a struggle right trying to get better at it so um it's just easier to be like distance it so has that worked no it's awful. It's an awful, <laughs> it's an awful way to live. And that's why I've tried to work on it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I understand it fully. I mean, especially when you, you still have the mission and you still, it's like, cool, done next. I still got to go to fucking work. Right. Right. You still right, have That's to the do. thing is cool. This happened. I was on admin leave for two weeks. Then I came back to restricted duty. So I was mm-hmm. doing administrative stuff, um, which is awful. It's like a punishment almost. Sure. Um, but I, like I try to take everything as a learning opportunity. So I came back and was working underneath one of our captains um, on like Kalia accreditation and policy review. Um, and he actually had me in there like doing some body camera review with him. He's like, hey, you hear when, you know, when cops say that they got fucked over by admin and that they didn't do anything wrong and we're just out here trying to get them. Just watch this. Just watch this body camera video for me. And then you just tell me what you think afterwards. Right. And I'm like, I would write him up. 
right? And he's like, right, but I'm going to go to his supervisor and I'm going to have a conversation with him. And who do you think is going to be the bad guy? And I'm like, you will be yeah. right. So there's a learning opportunity there. Yeah. Right. We want to demonize admin. Right. So I took that as an opportunity to learn, even though it was awful to come to work and do paper and policy and stuff. But, but then in a month I was back to work. Right. So like within 30 days I was back to work and then I'm out there doing exactly the same thing I was doing before. Did you just step, fall in step or, or no, was there no, an adjustment was, to getting back out there? No, that I made it, I made it about three weeks and then I got pulled off the line. Right. I, I did not realize how bad I was struggling. Mm. And I don't think it was from that shooting. I think that shooting was like the catalyst, maybe the, the final straw. I, I don't know what, what you would call it, but it was, um, I didn't realize how much I had repressed that, like all the trauma, right? Yeah. That was just kind of like, you know, when you got that, I, I, I and you got a glass that's filled with water and it starts to, what's that called? Like the coalescent bond or so, you know what I'm talking about? Like yeah. the water will actually, but then that one drop and then it pours out. Like I didn't realize that that's where I had been living. So, um, I got super lucky after that shooting, um, and came back to work. I was really going downhill. Like I wasn't making traffic stops. I wasn't, I was responding to calls, but I wasn't wasn't putting any effort into it. I was losing my temper. At one point I had to put myself in timeout because I'd lost my temper on somebody and started screaming at them. And, um, I knew it. Right. But I couldn't stop. So I like put myself in timeout. I, I, another cop was there and I was like, you handle it. And I went into my car. And then afterwards I was like, what the fuck, man? Like, I'm sorry. Like that was completely inappropriate. What's Jake doing? I don't know. He's got his nose against the I know back shit, of the truck. In <laughs> I know shit, put myself in timeout. Like I knew that I had lost my temper. Get in the corner, like, Jake. That's what I did. I put myself in the car. Um, so, and it was just little things like little arguments, little disputes. We were at briefing and a guy I worked with had made a comment about um, something stupid, but it was like implied to me that I was being lazy about something. And I mm. fucking lost my mind. You know, I hit the table and I stood up and across, like we got 13 people in briefing and the sergeant's there and I'm yelling across the table, you fucking piece of shit. You don't fucking, I do more in a fucking day than you do. Anytime you want to fucking see what lazy is, you want, you know what I mean? It was one of those things, yeah. right? Like I'm like 36 years old. You know what I mean? We're having this. Right. And the sergeant, he had to fucking hit the table and he's like, you fucking shut up. Right. Go to work. And then he's like, you need to come see me. And, you know, and he's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, fuck him. Right. It's his problem. It's his problem. Fuck him. Fuck him. And he's like, listen, I, I agree. But what the fuck was that about? And I'm like, I'm fine. I'll just go to work. So it was just this. It was like perpetual issues. Escalation. Yeah. So I got kind of an intervened. Right. They went to. It sounds bad, but like I wouldn't even talk about it, but I had a buddy who had killed himself about a year prior, a guy I worked with at the police department and that kind of put everybody on notice. Mm -hmm. So the department kind of, he, him killing himself probably saved me if, if that makes sense, because it put the people around me on notice that like, we got to start paying attention. So, um, I got pulled off the line and I got brought in and I are my deputy chief, man. I love that guy more than anybody on the planet. That dude, I respect like to the end of the earth. But he pulled me in and he's like, what's going on? And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm good. I just need to go back to work. And he's like, yeah, that's bullshit. What's going on? And I said, I'm fucking fine. I want to go back to work. And he's like, you're not fine. And I said, I'm fine. And it, it like that, it escalated. You see the TV show intervention where like the guy, you know what I mean? Like yeah. literally resist it to the point of, and I said, put me back to work or I fucking quit. That's where I'm at. Right. And he's like, yeah, I'm not gonna let you quit, but right. So it took him, it took a little bit and then it, it clicked and I went and did, uh, uh, an eval with our like police psychologist and I was going to go in and lie to her and just say what I needed to say. And it was like 10 minutes out before I got there that I don't know. I don't know what it was, but I was like, man, you just need to go and be honest. Cause like, this isn't working. Yeah. So I went in and I was honest with her cause I, I thought career's over. Right. So I was honest with her and she came back and she said, you like, you need help. Like there's something going on with you and it's not going to get better unless you do something different. So that was kind of what kind of problems were you having? Oh man, like not sleeping, um, anger, like these are, this sounds stupid, but those are issues that I have had forever. Sure. Right. From childhood stuff, uh, not dealing with that then being in the military and then law enforcement, EMS and the shootings. And then that crash that killed that little girl. And then it's just this perpetual problem. But this is when it kind of got to the point where it was like, I'd already, at this point, I'd already lost a marriage, right? I already was working on you know, ruining relationship with my daughter. I already, so it's just this perpetual problem. And it took like that final straw to be like, man, your fucking life has not been what it could be. Mm. So, um, and constantly avoiding it. Right. 
So avoid talking, avoid speaking about it, avoid anger is easy. Distract yourself. Right. And anger is great, right? Anger is a beautiful emotion if you just want to not deal with anything. Sure. Because nobody wants to talk to you if you're angry. So everybody leaves you alone. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if I'm sad, I'm just mad instead. Yeah, yeah. Right. If I'm, if I, you know, if I'm embarrassed, I just get mad instead. If you're right, if you're not sleeping, you just be angry. Right. It's, so there's just all of that. So I, I was honest with her and she kind of started the process to deal with that. And, and then it, then it's just been a little, what was their process? What helped you? Um, so I resisted it for a little bit. Um, my buddy, my Seems former to be the trend in this story here. <laughs> yeah, my, I did. That's uh, stubborn, man. Yeah. Stubborn. My buddy, who's the recon Marine I was talking about, um, he, I'm not a very religious person, right? I don't really have a religious faith. So like there were some people that were like pushing you towards like religious based programs or church. And for me, that just doesn't do it. I'm just not religious. So I don't gain any value from that. Raleigh, wonderful human being, very religious. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Mighty Oaks. Mighty Oaks? The Mighty Oaks program. Mm -hmm. So it's military, um, law enforcement, first responder uh, program, but it's kind of religiously driven, but it's 100% free. Um, they do um, they do retreats down here in Texas, Baylock, Baylock, Texas, Blaylock, Texas. Um, and that's that has saved a lot of lives, in my opinion. If I, I wish that I was religious. Yeah. Because I would go to it. But I just, I can't go to a program that's like heavily religious based. But Raleigh tried to get me to go there and, uh, you know. Could I you, up, could you just go and not, I mean, they start talking about, okay, take it with a grain of salt. Was there not other things than the religious component that they had to offer? I thought about that, but I did some more checking and it, the program is very guided by religion, yeah. right? And it ends with, it ends with uh, um, baptism and so just like. I'm not knocking the program at all. I, I honest to God, I think if you have a religious component to your life, that program is probably that program's probably saved more lives than than any other program out there. Honestly, it's an incredible program. Um, and a lot of our guys go through that. And Raleigh is a huge proponent for it. And I just wish that I could have found something in that. But I ended up going to a different program. I went to a different program in California <clears throat> that was seven days impatient. I don't want to call it impatient, but it was like you lived there for seven days. Yeah. Um, and that was probably the beginning. That was probably the beginning of getting things kind of back on track. Cause I was there with police officers, firefighters, almost all of them, former military. The entire program was run by, what would you say? It's, it's peer driven or peer. It's peer led, right? So we're talking military, police, law enforcement, fire, like peers that have been through that program in the past that have done that. And now they're coming back and dedicating their time to like helping the next group that comes through it. Um, but it's run by actual mental health professionals, right? And almost all of them are former first responders. Nice. So they're all psychologists, um, psychiatrists, counselors that are all former law enforcement. And um, so they bring that, like that medical component to it. So there's a lot of group therapy, group talking. And that's where I, where I kind of, realize that like vulnerability shared trauma is the most important thing well, how did that help you so the majority of that program was like group talk where everybody kind of has their thing right the thing that they brought there with them i think yeah um at least that's the kind of the the vibe i got from being in this with these other people was that everybody has their 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 bucket filled with shit yeah but then everybody kind of has this one piece of shit in the bucket that like tastes the worst that was the worst yeah so everybody kind of had their story and uh you know like those stories were shared amongst each other um so you know i won't reshare what some of those like the worst moments of these people's lives were but what i what i realized was that each individual person had all of this trauma but then they had this thing that they brought and now they're telling a group of people they just met something that they don't talk about to their own families mm. right one guy uh said that he had shared more with us in those few days than he had given his wife in the last 10 years right so like um so the vulnerability of that discussing those with each other and then listening to each other's story and then instead of being instead of just kind of pretending like it exists right like when somebody tells you a story you listen but do you really feel it do you and now all of a sudden you have this shared trauma where like i'm actually I mean, shit, you get like this grown ass dude telling a story in a vulnerable way and he's crying. And then you find yourself like 
getting all fucking teary eyed listening to this story. So there's this shared vulnerability that I think was the big change was allowing yourself to actually feel some shit mm -hmm. um, instead of starting to feel something and then immediately shutting it down. Cause that's what I would do is I would start to feel that uncomfortable emotion. I'd feel that sadness or whatever. And then I would immediately shut it down. Yeah. Right. Tuck it away or get angry. Right. Cause anger again is easy. That's the other thing I learned. It's not a, this isn't a counseling podcast here, but I learned that like anger is a secondary emotion. It's not yeah. a primary emotion. So it's impossible to be angry at first. Hmm. That's, that's what I had learned is. And if you think about it, right. And I've tried, I've replayed this in my mind and I try to like, if I have conversations with people, they're like, no, I can be immediately angry. I'm like, you can't, you cannot be angry immediately. You have to have something first and then it's followed by anger. If I punch you in the face, you're not angry at me immediately. You're what? You're upset. You're irritated. You're, you know what I mean? You're Unconscious. You're, you're fr <laughs> right. You're frustrated. You're, you're, you're in shock. You're processing. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then the emotion that comes after is anger. If I insult you, if I insult you, it's not anger that you feel at first. It's what? If you like me and you respect me, it's disappointment. Hmm. If you don't know anything about me um, and I insult you in front of other people, it's embarrassment. Um, right. If I, if I call you out because you did something wrong, you don't get angry. You, you, what initially you get embarrassed yeah. first, or you feel guilty first, right? Anger is secondary, always secondary. So anger, anger can be controlled. That's what they had talked about. That yeah. was one of the biggest things I got from it is that you can stop your primary emotion from becoming anger, but you can't stop your primary emotion. You can't keep yourself from feeling embarrassed. So what would be some primary emotions? Embarrassment, guilt, uh, sadness, uh, vulnerability, right? Um, Why do you think anger comes so easily if those are the, if we have to make that transition to it every time, if it's not our initial reaction, why is it the one that we seem to, to go to or, or feels so easy? Because anger is comfortable for us, right? <clears throat> it's easy military veteran, right? Combat. It's way easier for you to be angry at the people that you're fighting or that you're, you know, engaged with than it is for you to be empathetic or to be, you know, or right. So, so for people like us, I think people who are capable of violence, people who've been in those situations or just in general dudes, right. Um, as most women would probably agree that we are emotionally disconnected. We're all of these other things. Why? Cause if I, if I'm sad, I look weak, mm -hmm. right? So if I feel sad and I let you know that I'm sad and I talk to you about how I'm sad, I look weak, right? Yeah. Um, if you do something to irritate me or to upset me or, or you say something that makes me feel disappointed, it's easier for me to say, Hey, fuck you. I don't, you know, go fuck yourself. We're done. Don't ever fucking call me again. Right. It's easier to do that than it is to say, Hey man, I'm gonna be honest. What you just said kind of hurt my feelings a little bit and I'm feeling a little feeling a little sad about that. Gay. Gay. Right. That's what I mean though. But that's what, that's what it comes down to is it's easier yeah, for man. me to say, fuck you, lose my number. Yeah. Then it is for me to say what you just said hurt my feelings. And, and I'm disappointed that you would say that. I thought we were friends. I wouldn't expect my friends to say that. Yeah. Right. And then your response to that, if I do say that is to say what, instead of going, you're right, man, I can, I can see why that hurts your feelings. Right. I, it sounds so stupid, right? This is that stuff that you I think it's part of maturity. I mean, I can look back in the relationships I had in the Marine Corps and it was, it was kind of that way. There's a lot of bravado. There's a lot of fuck you. Feelings are stupid. Like, I don't care if I hurt your feelings. If what I said is true, then I owe it to you and the team to say it. Right. And if I can say it in a creative and offensive way, then all the better. Right. 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 <laughs> Massive fact. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but that's the problem is I think yeah. that it, I do think that in jobs like this, it's important that I need to be honest with you. Sure. I, I have those conversations with my peers all the time, especially mm -hmm. newer guys. Mm -hmm. Hey, what I'm about to say isn't going to be nice but it's meant to keep you alive. Yeah. That was fucking stupid. Don't ever do that again. Yeah. Right. I think it's a great a part of our communication in this community is the ability to do that. Um, but I also see the transition. And as I've gotten older and those operators have reached higher levels where we didn't need, they didn't need to, to divert to anger, to get me to obey or to get me to follow them. It was, it was a, it was a one-on-one. -on -one. I was like, Hey man, like what you're doing ain't working. 
and and then I I started to really appreciate those conversations much more. Right. And now the closest relationships I have are with people who do that. Yeah. Where I I can call a buddy and be vulnerable and most of the conversations that I have now with my friends sound like therapy sessions cuz they're just dumping stuff out and I'm just there to listen and try to help them and be encouraging and I can actually name the one friend now that I I still talk to or I respond when he texts, but he still communicates like a private. And it's like, hey, fucker, what's up today? Or what are you doing today, pussy? And I'm like, why Why do you speak to me that way? Right. Like, I don't speak to you that way. And I don't like that you're speaking to me that way. And he'll respond with like a middle finger emoji. And I'm like, all right, man. Like, right. if you're not there, that's fine. Like, yeah, I'm not going to engage when you're that way, but you're being a dildo. Right. And it's not even, it's not even meant to be malicious. It's no, just it's your, your communication style changes. Now I still yeah. have those friends when I'm like, sure. Hey, hey, what's up fucker. But, um, like, like our buddy Steve, right. Yeah. He made sure to send you a picture of my ass before I showed up today. Right. <laughs> yes, he did. Um, which is great. Uh, but, but you know, I've talked to Steve at length, um, and we've had, we've had similar conversations. You know, I think that's one of the reasons why he made the connection was I had talked to him about like, being in these shootings and um, the other things that come along with it and kind of some of that growth that happens. Mm -hmm. um, but I think anger is easy, but look at every relationship, right? I have a divorce, right? I'm not saying that my ex was perfect, but I'm certain that if we went back and wanted to keep like a tally mark for was Jake emotionally available? No. Yeah. Was Jake uh, accepting of criticism or feedback? No. Uh, did Jake ever express himself to you that he was feeling sad? No, he was just angry, 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 angry all the time. Oh, you call me out because I'm being lazy, because I'm being a bad husband, because I'm not spending time with our daughter. I'm being selfish. What was my response to that? Anger instead. Defensiveness, anger. Hmm. Um, because it's easier to be angry than it is to be anything else. And it's easier to be angry than to accept any responsibility. And that's, I think that's the big one. Um, and then I, the other thing that I got from there was being aware of what I was feeling and why as opposed to trying to hide it, right? I would feel a way about something. The The crash that I was telling you about that I don't ever talk about ever, um, that's, that's I, I still, I wouldn't even, yeah, that one's so tough. I, uh, the intersection where that took place for, for years after that crash, I avoided that intersection. Um, and if I had to drive through that intersection, I would, I would try to blank it out, right? It's just those stupid, those little things that you do, but I tuck it away and I push it away. Whenever I'd feel, whenever I'd start to feel something, I would, I would say, I quit being a fucking pussy. And then I'd push it away and then I'd move on with my life, right? But what I didn't realize is that you're like, you're chipping away at, at, at like you're, you're, you're choosing to carry it. Right. And you're chipping away at yourself every single time you say, man, this is, I'm feeling really shitty about this. So I'm going to insult myself. <laughs> for feeling that way. And then I'm going to ignore it. Right. And then it's no wonder that years after that, I, you know, you reach this tipping point. So, so that like, I think that's it. And I still don't talk about that one really ever with anybody. And if I do, I have a very safe, I mean, you can even tell I'm dancing around it. Like, sure. like I, that, that's, I could talk about the shootings all day, but that one, it's like, this is it. And then I can dance around it. Um, but it's, easier to acknowledge that like even me dancing around it like i feel a certain type of way about it but i own that so like i own that that's mine like i have that that's how i feel that will probably never change and i'm instead of pretending like it doesn't exist acknowledge it and move past it right those are that's that's the hardest thing to do hmm. but i think you get there eventually i think you can if you if you want to i mean and if go going to that retreat helps you sit down and, and analyze what you're doing, you know, and try to decipher, do I want to keep doing that? Like, is this working for my life? And what can I do to change? Uh, I've been to a couple of retreats, same place, but I've been twice. And it was very similar in that and kind of teaching me to stop and being so reactionary mm -hmm. and be more of have more of a response than a reaction Yeah, and to good. process. And, and it helps me. My whole thing is, is just trying to be a good father and husband at this point. Like I've put the guns down for the most part. I mean, I still train people, but I don't, I'm not active in any kind of a mission in that way anymore. And so when I have those visceral reactions to my six year old, 
you know, doing squaring up with me. And I'm like, who the fuck are you? No, you, you know, like this little six year old just stood at the top of the stairs, put his arms on his hips and was like, fuck you, daddy, you know, in his own way, you know, and, and trying to respond to that and not just have this. Cause I I mean, and I don't know if it's because we've served, I've got that drill instructor capability Mm -hmm. where I can go to 10 and I'm yelling and I'm in your face and I'm, I'm even being creative in my jokes as I'm yelling at you. You right. know what I mean? But I, that's not going to build a relationship with my son. And, no. And I don't, I don't want to. And it's not even going to work in what I'm, whatever I'm trying to get him to do. Like, I, I'm just meeting force with force. We train, com- you, like, you, you learn that you get compliance through force. And that works it's in certain aspects compliance. of your life, but it's it doesn't last. No, it's a very temporary compliance. And the moment I walk out of the room, the lessons lost and the rebellious side of him wants to do whatever it was mm-hmm. that I tried to tell him not to. And some of those things are for his own safety. And and I'm you know, I think it's great that you did that, man. And try it every day. Yeah, it is. It's a never ending thing. Is there a a daily, like a ritual or you, do you meditate? Do you, what is it that you do after that retreat? What have you taken with you to hang on to it? I think just reminding, I'm bad at, at, uh, creating a routine. Mm. I'm really bad at creating routines and then sticking with them. I, I don't know why. I don't know if it's ADHD or procrastination or I'd like, I just, I don't know what it is, but I live my life in a constant state of procrastination. Um, and with all the things I have going on, I'm constantly, I feel like I'm always behind. Yeah. Um, so I don't necessarily have a routine and I do. I, I think I would be better. I think I'd be further along in this journey if I would just do it. Um, but I make no excuse for it. And it's, it's, if I could just do it, I think I would be further along. Um, there are certain things that I always make sure to do. And that is, um, you know, like go to the gym. Um, I've really started creating, uh, the word no for me better with other people or the things that even with my business to say, mm-hmm. I can't do that. Um, I, th- I think for me, it's just reminding myself every single time I have that reaction, that visceral reaction, or every time I have that negative inward talk. You're feeling, uh, you know, I'm, I'm starting to feel shitty. I mean, even two seconds ago when we were talking, I'm talking about that crash. It, 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 it becomes, I think I'm hiding it. I'm like a I, neon sign, right? Sure, sure. There might as well be a neon sign that says like, man, this is not comfortable for Jake. Well, especially after reading the, what everybody is saying, bro. Right, you could see like, it. I'm totally cued in on body language, but as I see people now and what, they, especially my kid or, you know, whomever. And yeah, you, you can tell for sure. Right, like like I, might think, I might think, oh no, I'm hiding it pretty well. And like, you know, she's over there. Helping I'm like, out, typing on the computer. She's probably like, oh man, he's not comfortable right now. Anybody in the room would have been able to tell that I wasn't comfortable. But in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, you're hiding it well. The difference is, is at that point, having that conversation, like I'm not trying to hide it. Mm-hmm. Right now I'm trying to control it, but, but instead of hiding it and then feeling embarrassed about it, that's the difference I think is for me in that split second when I'm feeling really shitty about talking about it, instead of being embarrassed because I can feel it in my eyes and whatever, own it. Like, I don't give a shit. And that's kind of the thought is like, I'm talking about it. I'll talk about it as much as I can. I don't give a shit what the response is and then we'll control it. And then it, it is what it is, yeah. but I'm not going to walk away from here going, oh man, I can't believe you got all, you know, you're- it's okay to have an emotional response to experiencing or witnessing a tragedy, you know, and, and the worst thing happening to an innocent person. And that's where I think stuff with kids really affects us a lot because they had no control over being where they were in that moment. They're completely to the whim of their guardian of where they were brought or what position that they, they got, they got them hurt. And, uh, yeah, man, that's okay. Maybe nothing wrong with that. I think that's kind of the daily reminder. And then, and I think it's just constantly, you know, maybe it's not every day. I, I don't think I check myself in every moment. But I think every, you know, every couple of days, I kind of have to retake an inventory for like the last couple of days. Yeah. You know, how have I, what have I been like the last couple of days or, Hey, the last conversation I, the last argument I had with, with my girlfriend, how did that go? Mm -hmm. You know, and then take that inventory. Like, were you kind of a fucking dickhead during that argument? Did you own it? 
Yeah. Did you own the shit? Did you listen to what she was saying? Did you own what she said? Or did you just be defense? You know, and then it's, I find myself every couple of days having to go back and being like, Hey, I really appreciate you. Like, thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for being with me. Like my life is better because of you. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry for the times that I'm right. So I think that because I went years between those moments when I was married. Yeah. If at all. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I don't think you can do it in every single thing that you do, but I think it is like every, every time you have an opportunity to check that inventory, check that inventory and just be like, eh, what did I do and how did I deal with it? And did I, was that appropriate response? And I think, a, I think I would rather get genuine apologies from somebody who is bettering themselves every, you know, once a week than to get half-assed apologies or none at all. If it's genuine, you know, you hear that statement, like, I'm tired of hearing, sorry, I just want you to change. I yeah. think that's different than I am trying to be better. And sometimes I fail. Yeah. I mean, that's how you honor the person in, in the transgression is by giving them that change. Right. Or it does become empty. So like, right. yeah, you say, sorry, but you don't do, you put forth zero effort. And I think that, you know, we can forgive a whole lot when we see the effort being made. Yeah. When you don't see the effort being made, it, you don't really have much of an option other than to continuously place yourself in a situation with a person that repeatedly fucks right, you the over, same thing right? Over and over and over and over and over again, or push that person out of your life. Yeah. Like that's that's the the options at that point. Uh, and so the fact that you are still doing that is fucking awesome, man. Um, and you got to bring those people in too. Um, I don't think my ex wife knew the amount of struggle that I dealt with on a daily basis, right? Like mentally, I don't think, you know, I never, she was aware of my childhood, but I never really discussed it, you know, in any real way. I never, so what that, was, I think that's what was with your child. Just how my dad was, I mean, I always, I always, he worked right. I always made it to baseball practice and stuff, but, uh, but his, he, he hid is what he did. So he hid from my drug addict mom, hmm. right. To this day, my mom will still try to convince you that she didn't, you know, that she was a good mom, despite the fact that she spent 98% of her time high. Right. So those are, those are the things that, you know, and there was, there was a lot of that. And I, you, you talk about like forgiveness, right. And I, everybody says, you got to forgive, you don't have to forget, but you have to forgive. And I, you know, I don't know if I believe that, like, I think I can let it go, but it doesn't mean that I forgive some of those things, but I, I don't have a great relationship with my mom. We don't, we don't talk. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I grew up in kind of a, a household with the mom who controlled it and the dad who hid from it. Mm. So, you know, it wasn't an abusive household mentally for sure. Right. Um, drug use in the house for sure. But my dad would come home from work and he would read his books, lock himself in his bedroom and smoke weed. Cause that's what he did. Like, you know, dude grew up in the fifties, sixties, seventies. He was a hippie. That's, and I don't even care about the weed necessarily, but that was the, that was the outlet for him. That was his escape. That was his, so he escaped. Mm -hmm. So I think we had talked about this on the phone and I don't, I don't mean this in the negative way that I think people like us view the word coward, right? I don't think he's a coward in that he is not brave. Um, I think he was a coward in that he would rather have hid from what was going on and do nothing about it than to have any conflict. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it took me a while to come to that and say, like, that's how he dealt with it. Cause he didn't know how to avoid, he, he just had to avoid it. So there what, were negative. What was his childhood that like? Um, I think uh, he had a good childhood. Like his side of the family was good. He had uh, multiple brothers, sister, um, good household. I think, I don't know why he's always been, he's always been very conflict averse, mm -hmm. right? There's no, we're not getting to yelling and screaming matches. Um, we're, there's, we're not debating things, right? There's, there's no conflict is not good. So you didn't argue around dad. Yeah. He didn't get into those conversations. My mom and I would get into it a lot and he would, he would blow up and like, we had to be done. There was no fixing or solving anything. It was, we're not going to discuss. Just pretend that it never Just happened. Pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. So, that builds up like crazy. And my mom is a pusher. She wants to push and defend. I like, right. And then mix that in with drugs, heavy drug use and the people coming in and out of the house and all the things that came along with that. So I ended up being a protector for my sister is kind of what happened with that. Um, and I, I could have very easily gone down that path. I just got lucky to get some good mentors early on 15, 15 years old or so. I got some good adult mentors, which put me in programs with kids that were 
good, you know, good kids, good influences, good influences. And if it weren't for them, they saved my life without a doubt. So I got a good friend still in, in Casper, Justin, he knows who he is. If he watches mm-hmm. this podcast, I call him Bucky. He, uh, that dude saved my life definitively. He was one year older than me, joined the military a year before me. And all I wanted in life was to be like Bucky. That was it. So, I mean, I followed his steps to a T only he made it 20 in the military and retired and then became a cop. I got out, but if it weren't for him, I mean, him and Becky and, uh, Chad, uh, for sure. Tim, like those guys were adults or older than me that, that took me in that path. So I got a new family is what happened there. Um, so I ended up down going down the right path, but you know, I didn't learn relationships growing up. I didn't know what healthy relationship looked like. I didn't know what like a normal house looked like. Yeah. And then I joined the military and then I just, it just is this cycle of bullshit cycle of, of negative self-talk, negative self-worth. Yeah. Anger, confrontation. I think learning that as I'm growing up, my, my parents are too, you know, like I'm an experiment for them. They haven't been parents before. I have an older brother, but like for most parents, particularly your first child, like this is your, your first time being a parent, how to do that. And my biological dad was a a steaming pile and I don't really know him. Uh, He went to prison when I was around five and it took me a long time. He was very abusive to my brother and my mom, but never so much with me. He was kind of out of the picture by the time I came around, but, uh, it took me just kind of understanding like not everybody should be a parent. Right. You know, and he shouldn't have been one, had no business procreating. I'm glad he did. You know, I, I'm here for it, but, uh, yeah, not a, not a dad. And I'm glad that he left because had he stayed, I would have been way more fucked up. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Way more. My brother ate most of that and it, it, it had a a huge effect on him. Even as a father now, I don't know that he's able to physically discipline his son because he just can't go there in his mind because he took years of abuse and yeah, not everybody's supposed to be one. No, no, I see it all the time. And you know, that's okay. I don't know if he, I don't know if he's still alive, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Forgiveness, forgetting for, you know, or just being able to to understand it in a way that it doesn't affect you anymore. Either way, it's good. Yeah. I think the other realization too is I spent, it took me a long time to realize how much, you hear people say, ah, oh, you're just making excuses, right? And I get that. I'm I'm all about, I hate excuses. Yeah. But man, like you don't realize how much growing up in an environment like that affects how you are as an adult yeah if you don't learn how to develop relationships right what pisses me off right here's that secondary emotion what pisses me off is that i wasted 20 plus years of my life being fucking angry and defensive and resistant to critique um and selfish and i ruined every single relationship to include a marriage and i and i was on my way and probably still am in some ways, just a little more aware of it to not helping my relationship with my daughter. Hmm. Um, and there's like this, you got to own that cause that's on me, but some of it's like, you know, fuck you for being a piece of shit drug addict for my entire life and doing the things that you did and making sure that instead of me growing up in an environment that set me up for success, I had to fucking kick and scream and climb over every single obstacle to get there. And have to fight this emotional battle. And that's not to say people that grow up in great households don't have issues either. But you know what I mean? There's like sure. this part of it. It's like, how fucking dare you do that? Yeah. Um, and then you look back on it and you go, I wonder what my life would be like had I not gone through that. So am I better because of those experiences or am I worse? And I. I don't know. I think about it all the time too. Because, you know, in in trying to right the wrongs of my childhood or th- give my kid the things I thought I needed. A lot of those hardships are what gave me character, what gave right. me the ability to get through things later that weren't tied to t- child traumas. And so how do, how do you manufacture the necessary hardship and lessons that are going to benefit your kid while omitting the hardships that you know are only going to fuck them up? And what are those? 
I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. And so. Well, God, my daughter, she's got an iPad mm-hmm. and an iPod. Or an iPad and an iPhone. How and old, AirPods. How old She's 13. She? 13, okay. Um, and a MacBook, right? And it's yeah. like, but her whole life revolves around them in some way because all of her school stuff has to be done on a computer, right? So there's this. And then because I have her part-time, right? And now my ex and I, we get along fine. Like there's a very clear understanding that like it just wasn't meant to be like, this yeah. was not a compatible relationship, but that's good. But there has never been any turmoil and for, you know, as far as our divorce or, or, um, my daughter or how we split custody. I mean, I would, I like, am very lucky in that aspect. Yeah. That's so good. I have, I have a list as much as I want and you know, they just, she just got back from Costa Rica. Um, you know, it's not like I'm not the dad that's like, well, I need extra time with, her. you know what I mean? Like, go ahead, go have fun. I sacrifice time with her to be honest with you because she's in band and, um, sports and, choir and all of these things at school she lives so close to the school at her mom's house um that i sacrifice a lot of time with her so she doesn't have to wake up extra early or she doesn't have to ride a bus you know what i mean so there's yeah uh, and at 13 that's a tough age i mean they're they've got one foot out the door oh yeah and she doesn't care about me she yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah i get i get one i like i message her i'm like hey how's costa rica fine yeah they like, say like you only have until they're 18 you've got until they're like 12 yeah. And then they're, they want to be with their friends. Mm-hmm. You're no longer cool. That's the weekends. Like, Hey, did you want to come like coming over this weekend? Well, I was going to do a sleepover. And then what am I going to say? No. Yeah. No, you can't go hang out with your friends. Cause I want, so there's this sacrifice of yeah. time. Yeah. Um, then they come and just pout on the couch. Mm-hmm. I'm here, dad. And I'm here to appease you. Yeah. And I'm, I would never be that dad. Like, yeah. That's the important thing for me is I am not more important than my daughter. My daughter is more important than anything else on the planet, right? Yeah. That's the difference. And I think some people lose sight of that to include myself because there are times when I'm having to make a decision. Oh, I've got this, this, and this coming up. I have to do this, this, and this for my business, for work, for this. She wants to do something. And now I'm having to go, fuck, I can't spend time with her and do all of this. Um. Right. And then you're in this weird dilemma because on one breath you can say, well, I'm sorry, I can't do that because I've got these other things, but I don't get this back. Mm -hmm. This isn't going anywhere. So it's, it's like finding that balance of saying, fuck my business, fuck my job, Mm -hmm. um, fuck this extra money that I might get because of this. I'm going to spend time with my daughter and finding that balance has been hard. Um, but I'm working on it and I am not doing very well here lately. And I, and I owe, I owe her better. Well, it's not a problem that you solve. It's one you manage. Yeah. Right. Because as they get older, they withdraw a little bit more and they get more freedom and they have their own lives that they're pursuing their own things. And that door will open up more. Right. Right. And you're, you're right in the middle of that transition at 13. And I want to bring her too. I was going to bring her to Austin actually. Oh yeah. Um, but she was just getting back from Costa Rica with her mom yesterday yeah so it just didn't work out but yeah like i would have absolutely brought her out here to austin she did she'd had fun so no doubt no doubt yeah man uh what i brought my thing here we talked about a whole bunch of stuff um what's it like being like how has being a cop affected you as a father my dad was a cop and by the time i graduated i knew i did not want to be a cop right <laughs> um I, for you you go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, for me, I felt like he always thought I was lying to him. Everything was an investigation. And he was a detective. Okay. But, I mean, even down to the littlest thing, if if he thought he knew better, it didn't matter what I said. And there were a couple of very specific examples that, like, we had this curtain in the bathroom that had these doily balls on it. And they all came up missing. And they and he accused me up one end and down the other of cutting these things off and hiding them and whatever. I'm just like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I'm like, five, right? I'm like, no, I didn't do it. He's like, you're lying. And you now you're in trouble for lying. And then like a week later, they found like this mouse nest where it had chewed all the balls <laughs> off and stored them in the thing, right? And there's a couple incidents like that. But I remember feeling repeatedly like this motherfucker just thinks everybody's a liar. Right. You know? And, and so I'm curious, what is... Does being a cop have an effect on you? I don't see how it couldn't as a father. Like you're aware of the worst things happening in the world at any moment. And you have a 13 year old daughter anxious to go get out there and experience yeah, it. You know, how, how do you manage that? Um, you know, I think that I, 
I've always done pretty good at keeping an individual identity. Um, better in the last few years than, mm. than prior to that. We talked about it earlier. I think, I think one of the biggest problems that cops or even, even like long, long-term military folks, um, the, the biggest problem we have is we create an identity around our job instead of creating an identity, instead of your job being part of your identity. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you see it with cops all the time. And I am not saying, don't be proud of your profession. Don't, don't, don't like what you do. Don't be, you know, don't, don't post about it and things like that. Like, that's not what I'm saying, but God, I, I know so many people who their whole identity is law enforcement, right? All they talk about is law enforcement. All they wear are cop shirts. Their Facebook page is filled with cop stuff. Um, their cars have cop stuff on it. You come to their house and all their cop shits hanging up on the walls. Um, and their whole identity becomes being a cop so much. So are you, are you familiar with Dr. Gil Martin? I'm not, but I was a fireman. So I think I know you what you're probably saying did. right so, now. <laughs> so it's, a, it's emotional survival for law <laughs> yeah, enforcement. He yeah. reads that book. <laughs> okay. Um, firemen do it too, but firemen actually by Gil Martin's, um, own assessment guys a genius when it comes to this stuff firemen typically do way better than cops okay because firemen deal with trauma mm -hmm. but firemen shut it off because they they have more time off generally because they're working 24 on 48 off um and you'll see it like when a fireman needs extra money what do they do pick up another job they or do pick up another job or start a business yeah yeah right when cops need extra money what do they do overtime overtime yeah okay um and this is the way he described and this uh, this was huge for me Okay, you've got you've got your level, right? And anybody who knows emotional emotional survival for law enforcement knows that. But you have, you've got, you've got normal, and then you have this this elevated, and then below normal. But this is kind of your range, right? Cops when they come to work immediately go above normal. You're activated. Cops are activated the entire time they're at work. So if this is your line, cops are here the entire time they're at work. So they come on shift. And they're at work and they're in condition yellow for the entire time. And then they fluctuate between condition yellow, red and black, red and black, yellow, red and black while they're at work, right? Man with a gun, red. Uh, I've got my gun on somebody, condition black, right? And it's this, this, this for 12 hours. And then they come home. And instead of going back to normal for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. However, they've been excessively high for 12 hours. So instead of coming back to normal at home, what do they do? They crash. Mm -hmm. So cops are depressed, right? They're not depressed. They're just on the opposite end of where they've been. They've been accelerated for so long that now they're at home. So now what does that look like though? I don't really feel like going anywhere. I don't really want to make dinner. I don't really want to do yard work. I don't really want to hang out with the kids. Yeah. I just want to lay here and take some time. Can't you just leave me alone and let me relax, right? And then you're off shift. And then what happens? Bam, you're back on shift. And then you're here and you do this and normal doesn't exist for you ever anymore because it takes weeks for you to start to return back to normal. So you're constantly in this cycle, whereas firefighters don't have that. They spend 48 hours on shift. Of those 48 hours, we know that most of them aren't fires. So they're not constantly in this, I'm about to die category, which isn't to say it's not dangerous. It's just, it's a different thing. Sure. So how do cops deal with that? Right? Down here doesn't feel good. Up here feels good, but down here doesn't feel good. So we want to avoid being down. So how do we avoid being down? Donuts. Donuts. <laughs> Sugar we stay high. at work. We stay at fucking work. Yeah. Wow. We stay at fucking work. You contracted and you were in the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. right? You felt great when you were there mm -hmm. and you were doing that. But how long did it take you to start to feel normal again when you come home? It was so exotic where those emotions and how that all just hits you when you get home. It's like, I was fine for seven months. The moment I've been home for a week now and yeah, you feel it or you break down. I remember in 2005, I had 10 of my friends killed in one day and I didn't even mourn them in country. Like, I mean, I felt it right, but there was no reaction. There was no emotion. It was very numb. And then one bottle of Jack Daniels in a swimming pool later, like I was in the bathroom just bawling and uh, ended up not remembering most of that night, just drinking it away and then couldn't hold it in, right? Like it's as I poured it in, the shit just came out, right? And feeling like, why? Why did that hit me now? Why couldn't I have done that in country, not in front of my girlfriend or my friends? Right. Or, you know, like of all the places we're barbecuing at the pool and I'm crying in the bathroom. Like, what you're the here. fuck? This, uh, that's why. Yeah. Because you're here, right? Here, 
is when I'm with my friends doing hood rat things at, at yeah. work, right? Oh, I'm guy with a gun, drugs, you know, felony stop, uh, domestic, fighting with somebody in their front yard, like boom, 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 boom. It's this, this constantly. And then I come home and it's, that's why won't you spend time with the kids? Why won't you hang out? I really have this project I really wanted to help me with. Can we please redo this floor? Can we please change the carpet? Could we please do this? Can we please go over to my parents' house? I don't want to fucking deal with that. I want to sit here in my own solitude and be left the fuck alone until I go back to work. And then it's, oh man, I love it. And we're all happy and cheery and cheery and cheery. And then they say, well, whenever you're with your friends, you seem to be fine. But when you're with me, you're an asshole because mm-hmm. I hate being here because when I'm here, I'm not normal. And I'm not, I'm not elevated. I am below normal. So it's depression, but it's not, they call it depression. It's not. And you avoid this by being here. Cause if I'm not at work, I'm here. Hmm. So I spend every possible fucking minute at work, every overtime shift. I become the best employee on the planet. I'm the best police officer. I get the most arrests. I get the most felony arrests. I am the most reliable, but I'm also a fucking shit husband and a shit father an asshole friend and unreliable in every other aspect of my life because I function here all the time. And I can't function here because down here looks like depression and apathy and disgust, right? That's the problem. And nobody wants to acknowledge that shit, Hmm. especially in American law enforcement. In, in, In Australia, cops get a year sabbatical for every five years of employment. Really? It might be even three. It's either three or five years. If you were a police officer in Australia, at your five year mark, you get a year off of work paid free. Wow. To go, just to go live your life. That was my next question. Like, so how do we work in that downtime? I don't, I don't know. Or like, what do you mean? What do the cops do in that downtime? Anyway, like, how do you solve that? Because if you just stay at work so that you don't deal with that, eventually you're going to have something happen. Either you're going to crack, you said like your your friend committed suicide, or you're going to get kicked off the force, you're going to get fired, you're going to get into a bad shoot somewhere because you lost your shit. And God help you if the media, if it works with the media narrative, your life is over. It's American law enforcement has treated its cops like dog shit for the entirety of its, of its, of its existence. Come here, work for 20 years, get paid, just enough to live. Mm -hmm. Here's your half-ass retirement when you're done. Um, And then also, by the way, um, you're going to get two weeks per year, but we're going to really kind of complain when you try to take vacation because we're short-staffed. And then we wonder why cops routinely lose their tempers, commit suicide, get fired, right? Another huge one that Gil Martin talks about is you want to know why the, like, something that cops are really, and same with the military, are really good at doing, they're really good at cheating on their spouses. Why though? Because cheating on a spouse is what? It's a compensation. It's a, it's a coping mechanism, mm. right? My spouse is boring because I live my life with my spouse when I'm down. So if I'm having this other, right, the beginning, the, what, it, what is it called? The, uh, the honeymoon stage, Yeah, the new relationships, always exciting, right? And the lying and it's, it's here. That's everything is here. That's why it happens. Wow. And they talk about that a ton and it's like. Cops in Australia make it a lot longer in their careers um, and generally are far happier at commensurate pay scales because of the amount of vacation. I think, I think for every nine months work, they get three months off and for every five years work, they get a year off, something like that. What's the return rate? Are they, are the attrition rate? Are they, I think it's, I think, I think Australia has a very good model. I don't, I don't want to quote Dr. Gil Martin on, on his studies exactly. Cause I'm not sure, but he uses that mechanism, that, that metric a lot. That is an example of how we can do better. The difference is, is Australian is generally government run law enforcement. Whereas we're right. We've got all kinds of stuff, right? You've got, you might have a city with 300 people and one cop and that one cop can't take vacation. Yeah. So, and then that's the other thing with us is you deploy, you're in combat, you come home for a period of time, you get to change the way that you live your life. Cops every single day, 40 hours a week, minimum, are in condition yellow home condition yellow home condition yellow home condition for 20 years yeah and then they retire and they die that's fucked up for sure and they invest their whole identity becomes being a cop you want to know why cops lose their minds when uh when a new chief comes in and says you got to wear a different hat or we're going to change the beard policy we're going to change the tattoo policy or we're going to put you in different pants because your whole identity is revolving around law enforcement and if you can't change it and you don't feel like you have control over it you lose your fucking mind so cops will get themselves fired over a hat. Really? 
or over a beard policy. Like that's, it's crazy to me when you, and when you really start looking at it, like the guy's a genius and he breaks that down. What was his name? Gil Martin. And Dr. What was, Gil Martin. What was the book? Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement. Emotional He's got survival. a new version too. That's. So there's two books for you guys. There's yeah. uh, Joe Navarro, What Every Body Is Saying, and then. Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement. <coughs> it's, generally, it's pretty commonly pushed on all cops. Okay. Um, but if you, if you haven't read it, you should. Like it's, and I mean, really read it. Like, don't just read it. Like really try to take it to heart because it, it can save your career. That's the biggest thing for me is making sure that I keep an identity. And it's they, not being a cop. They introduced that to you at this retreat? No, no, that I've been hearing about that for okay. my entire career, but we actually brought him out to our area and he spoke on a tour. Wow. Um, the guy's great at, at what he does. He's a, I mean, it's, it's a good one, but that's, that's it is creating that identity. I would like to know that if I stopped being a cop tomorrow, mm -hmm. wouldn't matter. Do you think that that would happen? If you stopped tomorrow, would, would it have an effect on you? I would miss certain things but I would be happy living my life. What would you miss about it? I think that as dumb as doing hood rat things with my friends, yeah. I like going out and catching people who make society worse. Mm. And that hunt, you know, going out and finding bad people doing bad shit. Right. I, I, it always makes you feel bad when you take kids out of somebody's house. But when I can put kids, when I can take kids away from a house filled with meth, mm. right? Like that feels pretty good. Not uh, obviously like the parents aren't happy about it, but well, um, when you can, when you can prevent people and, you know, people victimizing people, um, you know, you catch people out burglarizing cars like the, you know, it's always nice when you catch those people and you get to return some shit. But as far as, as far as overall, I don't think I, cause you see these guys that retire after 20 years and they try to hold on to it forever. And they just, they continue to try and hold on to their career that they had, but, and they just spend the rest of their life chasing what they did. And it's like, you just, you, you kept, you held an identity instead of being a cop. Now you're a retired cop. So your identity was cop. Now, whenever you introduce yourself now, Hey, I'm Jake. I, uh, retired law enforcement, right? I don't, I, I rarely introduce myself as a cop. And most of the time when people ask what I do, I say video photo stuff. Um, I don't, I don't really. Cause I'm trying to keep that identity different. You're just contrarian. Yeah. A <laughs> bunch of boots. Bunch of boots. Yeah. Oh, you're a cop now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Coolest thing you've ever done, huh? Yeah. I think that that'll, I think that'll serve you, man. I think it really will. I, I, I feel like I understand what you're saying. And I, I felt some of that as well. in in being in the Marine Corps, like, I don't want this to be my identity. This is a stepping stone in my life. Right. And the same with the fire department and contracting, I think, was the longest I ever spent anywhere, about nine years doing that. But it is in the back of your mind, like at some point in time, I'm going to have to stop. You know, I mean, I'm going to have to find something else to do. And it's hard to know what to do when you've had when you've lived at that level for so long. How does everything else not just feel mundane? and feel gray and, and like, what the fuck do I do with the rest of my life? Cause I peaked at, you know, 25 or yeah. whenever, whenever, you know, you felt you peaked. Um, what, what do you do with your identity? Where, how do you identify Mr. Jake? I male, I, female. <laughs> yeah. They, them, <laughs> they, them. Um, I think I'm trying to re-identify as, as a, as a dad first, mm -hmm. uh, I, on a, this sounds like I want to identify as Jake Bigelow. Like that's, I'm Jake. That's what I'm going to identify as not Jake the cop. Yeah. Not, uh, I, I want to identify as me, you know, like even coming on here is an opportunity, I think to, to say like, there's more than just being a cop or more than just being in the military. Um, like we were, we were talking earlier, I do photo video, um, our mutual friend, is a part owner in, in a company that I own with another buddy, um, for video production. Um, albeit we're not as big as we'd like to be yet, but we're working on it. Um, you know, like I'm okay with that. Um, I just bought two movie theaters, two old, like built in the 1920s theaters. Wow. One's a small stage, one's a big stage with three other partners. And we're in the process of remodeling those. I've got a lot tied up in that. And if it fails, I'm going to, need some overtime shifts, but, <laughs> um, you know, like we're trying to do that. Right. So I'm 
put my time into that. We want to run an indoor concert venue and comedy and, and stuff like that. That's awesome. Um, so we just did that. So there's th- that component to it. Um, I, I fly a ton. Um, I, I want to fly professionally. I'm working towards all of that, uh, building the relationships in that community, fly my plane all the time. It's small. It's like a, like a SUV with wings, it's like a 1982 SUV with wings, but nice. So I think, I think that's, what's important is I want to know that if I were to leave being a cop tomorrow, I still have all these other things that I'm doing, but first and foremost, I think reestablishing kind of your, your personal identity instead of what it is that you do. I don't want to be Jake, the cop or Jake, yeah. the photographer, or Jake, the business owner. It's like my keep identity. irons in the fire. I, I'm trying know? to keep irons yeah. in the fire, but people, yeah. people ask all the time. They, I hear this, this drives me nuts. And I'm, I am not Dave Ramsey. All right. I'm not like. I'm not on here giving fucking financial advice. And this is probably the stupidest thing that anybody could say, but this is my mindset. So I'll own this. I don't want to make it to retirement. Mm. It's not my intention. I don't want to make it another eight years and get my retirement. And the reason why is because in Wyoming, my retirement is 50% of my highest five years. So maybe 60 grand is what I'll get for my retirement, but it's taxed. Oh yeah. Wyoming does an awful job at giving colas, right? For all the Wyoming legislators listening to this podcast, fix the fucking retirement system. Um, so let's say I make it another eight years, right? I'll be 48 years old. Um, and what I'll have to show for it, a fucked up back, a fucked up neck, two officer involved shootings, uh, jaded, angry at the world, right? Like all of these things that I get that, that come along with that, um, failed relationships, so on and so forth. And what do I get for that time? Here's approximately $60,000 a year taxed, no health insurance, and you'll be lucky if you get a COLA raise, right? That's what my retirement is. I don't want to make it to retirement. Yeah. You can't live off that. Cause I can't live off of that. Yeah, you can't retire. That's not a retirement. No. So, so I want my businesses to take off and I want to make all the money I need to live comfortably before retirement. I don't want to walk away from the police department. People say, oh, you only had four more years left. You should have got your retirement for what? I'll make that next month. I'll make that next month. Yeah. So I don't need that retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm not going to make it to 48, get a bullshit retirement, live on a fixed income for the next 10 years till I die of a fucking heart attack, um, fat and, uh, miserable in my house. Yeah. Right. Like I don't want to do that. And I'm not saying every cop goes that route, but a lot do. A lot do. A lot of people do. You've got that trait of hunger. Yes. You're fucking hungry and you're out there. And even though you have the thing you could squat in, you're choosing not. You're choosing not to sit and do the comfortable thing. And there's a lot of people that do oh, that. I re- comfortable with it. My favorite conversation to have overseas sitting in trucks on venues was, hey, man, what's your side hustle? Like, what's your grind? What is your what is your out plan from this? And it would either be a 30 minutes of excitement while they divulge what they're really passionate about or, oh man, I'm here till they close the doors. Like I can't afford, like I got child support and I'll figure it I'm out. Like, I'll figure it out later. Really? Like you, you don't give a fuck. Just, you're I, just going to cycle this till you age out you're, and then you'll worry about it. And there, and there's a lot of people I that don't, people don't, get they it. don't want to, and they go back to, you know, the hooch or the barracks or wherever, and they're playing video games and they're, <laughs> you know, and we would have like real estate meetup groups on Saturday nights where, you know, just, I'd stick bulletin board or like posters on the bulletin board thing, like real estate meetup, anybody interested or have anything to share, please fucking come. And, and the people with the hunger would show up. That's it. That's the right. three partners that I like. We are, when this is done, these two theaters between purchase price and remodel will be about $2.4 million. I don't have $2.4 million. All right. I have assets. I have some equity. um, I have some collateral and I had some cash. Yeah. Right. But the three partners that came in on this with me, I am the least contributing of the four partners. Right. Um, I I mean, in my own way. Right. Like, I think I have something to contribute to. They would have brought me in. But it is an opportunity that I was allowed to be a part of because these people aren't stupid. The other three partners are successful and they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be a part of this partnership if I wasn't that, right? That's how I look at that. So I was able to get into this and will contribute in any way possible to make this successful. And all I need is one success for another success. Yeah, Um, It's like coming out here. I didn't know when I said, hell yeah, I'll come out to Austin and be on this podcast that, um, that you would reimburse me for the flight. Right. I just bought the ticket because Steve said, 
you should go be on this podcast. Good opportunity. Yeah. That's the things that people don't understand. My, my question was never, do you buy the ticket for me or do I get paid or what do I get out of this? It was, I get an opportunity to go be on a podcast. Sure. Done. Bought the ticket. And then it was later, I think where I it was like, oh no, we reimbursed that. I just need your, you know, and I'm like, oh no shit. Okay, cool. I'd have bought first class tickets if I'd have known it was going to be reimbursed. But <laughs> He doesn't mean that. Don't listen right. to him. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, like, dude. Yeah. That's the point is if you don't take opportunities that are given to you, you will lose your mind and you'll just be, me- you will be mediocre for the rest of your life. And you'll wonder for the and rest of your life, the what your the life. fuck could have happened? What I, could I have done? Dude, hundred percent. So that's why I don't want to make it to retirement. And again, the two, like the, the other shooting that I got into, um, it's, it's like you're, I think cops look at that one, uh, particularly snipers, mm-hmm. like sniper teams. Actually, I, I got to plug my buddy. I won't say his name right now, but he was just in one recently. It's still under investigation, so we can't discuss it, but he's an SRT sniper and took a completely justified, insane shot. Um, like guy should be put up on a pedestal. Right. For the shot as a sniper. Not many people do that. And, um, but what I worry about for him, and I hope he listens to this is he will ride this wave. And the wave is you're on a pedestal right now. You took like, you took a shot that most people will never take. And you shot a cop killer who was going to go kill other people. And you did it standing offhand after 30 hours in the cold. Like it's a great shot. And, but there's an after effect to this. And that after effect is people stop giving a shit. Mm. And if you make that shooting your identity and you keep trying to talk about it, yeah. you're only making it worse for yourself, hmm. right? I My first one a couple of years ago, or God, 2016, I guess it's been more, it's been what, eight years now, almost eight years, um, was a 60 yard shot with an optic off a rifle, right? From the dark in a spot where he didn't know I was at. And he came out and started shooting at people on the other side. And that for a while, you got put on that pedestal. Yeah. Because it's, it's not a common thing that. Right. You also don't shoot people point blank in a car driving down the road either. So I like, I guess I just get the best of all of it, but, um, there's an after to the, all of that. And when that, when it runs out, it's hard to, you, there's no more wave to ride. Yeah. I think that comes with having had the experience because you don't know what's going to happen. You know, when I first, and this is nothing like what you're saying, but, uh, at least with the public, when I first did naked and afraid, I was more anxious about the episode airing than I was doing the challenge. And it was, how is the public going to respond? Like, I have no idea. And nothing really bad happened, you know? It it was, but you you feel it. You're like, fuck, the the internet's just savage as shit anyway. Like, (laughs) it is. And I don't know why, man, but I read, I read all the comments on all of them. I don't know why. Big mistake. Big mistake. You know, it's. I, I'll, actually, as bad as this sounds, the only comment that ever bothered me on the most recent one is somebody called me a double murderer is what happened. Really? Um, they was said, the why is pregnant? this? pregnant? Yeah, no, it was because I, it was my second one. Oh. Um, somebody said, hasn't he already killed somebody? Um, so now he's murdered two people. Why is he still a cop? He's dangerous or something like that. Right? Like that one. I, I, I don't want to say it bothered me. That's giving it power. That didn't bother me, but I was kind of like. Well, our understanding of the English language these days is shit. Like murder and killing are very, murder has a definition. It's premeditated. And you can't say he was premeditated and knew that that if you had known that guy was going to take off in the car, I don't think you'd have got in there. I I probably would have been a little bit more resistant. And future (laughs) reference when I see that, right? Yeah, yeah. No, there was a a tactical, I don't think there was anything we could have done different on my first one. That guy guy shot into neighbor's houses, drew the police there. When they showed up, he shot at them. He ran back into the house. About 15 minutes later, I had already gotten on scene. I came up through an alley, stalked up between two houses, got behind concrete in the dark, set up on, on, um, it was like 57 yards or something through a four power optic is, yeah, I might as well have been standing there. Right. It's not, it's yeah. not anything, um, great. And he came out with the rifle, started shooting at the lights and I shot him and it's very, very clear. Like that one, I don't think we could have done anything different on that. Yeah. The, the getting in the car situation, I call it my non-consensual Uber ride, like one star Uber ride for sure. Um, is, uh, it's that, it's that desire to go after the thing that you're, you know, is trying to get away from you. Yeah. And that's how cops end up in cars. And I, I got, it drops my heart when I see other videos and I've seen plenty after that, right? I actually reached out to one guy who was in one. It was so much like mine that when I watched it, I was like. I had a full reaction to it. Yeah. Um, and I reached out to his agency 
and I, I just said, hey, here's a video to mine. This is my info. Here's a copy of my police ID. So you know that this is really coming from me and I'm sending it to you from my police email address. Would you please let him know that I went through something similar? And if he wants to talk to me, here's my phone number. Nice. And like two months later, I got a text message from the guy and we talked for a couple of days and I didn't know this guy at all, but like I identified with what he went through and he had a lot of the same concerns and issues I had it was like, how fucking stupid was it for me to end up in that car? And I'm like, dude, you didn't do it on purpose. That's the thing people don't get is I didn't jump into that car on purpose. Yeah. Just hard to understand. I think it's, it sounds at least a lot like, you know, getting sucked into the room doing CQB. There's a guy standing percent. in there. It's like, don't get sucked into him. It's like, stay on your walls. Go where yeah, you're it's, Yeah, it's like go. coming through the door and there's a dude here and you suck in on him and you don't turn your corner. You don't. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand percent. Yeah. A thousand percent. Right. And what you don't realize is like you get sucked in on this guy and then this guy kills your partner mm -hmm. because you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's or the, they can't address the threat because you're standing in, you're standing front in the room. Of them. Same right. concept. Teaching cops CQB is like hurting cats, by the way, because <laughs> we don't train it enough. Um, yeah. Like and that's the SRT guys <coughs> on it. That's all they do. They that's run, their jam. Yeah. That's their jam. They run that all the time. But like getting a, you know, a hodgepodge patrol team to clear a room like, you know, you come in and you and you cover your area mm -hmm. and you hope that you don't get shot from the other side mm -hmm. if you and i are doing that i know you have that yeah but i'm doing that with a cop i never work with and never trained with and i'm you know you're kind of like yeah now you know, imagine doing an active shooter and you're running in there with guys all around your department that you might remember his name yeah <laughs> yeah you come over here yeah I need so some that's, help. that's it yeah. so there's you know all in all though i think I, like I would never discourage somebody from becoming a cop. Mm -hmm. I would just say that we need to be better early on at this type of conversation with yeah. these guys. There needs to be better preparation for the mental health aspect of it. And city administrators, I think for the most part, chiefs are on board with this type of stuff. We need to do better at giving them time off, but they are limited to the city administrators, yeah. the city managers, the council members, the finance, HR representatives, you can't take your cops and put them to work for 20 years, giving them two weeks of a year and say that you're doing any f anything other than fucking destroying them. Yeah. Right. The city's so, going to chew them up. They will. They're going to, that's what's going to happen. You're a number. I worked with a guy. I worked with a guy for years. Great cop made one mistake. Ended up resigning in lieu of a, a termination. Um, did not deserve a termination, deserved punishment, deserved discipline. Um, but they destroyed him. Guy had been a cop for 10 years, had done more than many other cops. He was completely forgotten about in several weeks. Yeah. Within a couple of weeks, his spot had been filled and he's just a fleeting memory. And most of the department doesn't even know him because they never worked with him. Yeah. Right. So what does that tell you about what your place is in this world or in that job? I think the, the claim of brotherhood is is a bold wishful thought yeah. because you, they might need you one day. Right. And so I noticed when I was a fireman, a lot of that, like, Oh, I was from the Marine Corps to the fire department. It's a brotherhood here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they might need you to pull them out of a fire, but the moment that you're leaving, that phone quits ringing, those texts quit coming in. You're not getting called to go drink with the boys anymore. And maybe you're out of the club. And so, but that only stayed with guys I went to legit combat with. Right. And, and even then though, and this is the caveat to that though, if you and I go through a bunch of shit together and we experience that, it doesn't matter if one stays and one goes, you and I will always have those experiences and we can draw from those. Yeah. But all of the people that come after me that you're still working with mm -hmm. and I've left, they don't give a fuck about me. No, they don't. And they don't have give that a shit connection. how long I was a cop, mm -hmm. how many medals I got, how many awards I got, or what I did. They don't care about me. Right. Only you care about me. Right. And as soon as you're out of the club, everybody who comes after you will not give a fuck about you either. It's true. And 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 I know that sounds jaded, and maybe it's different in some places, but in my experience, once you were gone, the only people who you relate to are the ones who you did it with. After that, it's done. Yeah, the only people who remember you worked later are your kids. Correct. <laughs> Correct. That's true. Yeah. That, that's a thousand yeah. percent. They are the ones who will remember that you stayed late or picked up a bunch of overtime shifts or never had time. Yeah. Their dad's a cop. Yep. That's his identity. He's not my dad. He's a cop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, I, I think that my, my daughter doesn't, she knew actually it, this, this one sucked when I went back to work. So after I got pulled off the street for a little while and did that deal, I took, a, I volunteered to take a break and I took an administrative job inside the department doing career services, training, background investigations, recruiting, which for me is tough because I'm sitting in an office, right? But I got to wear some Hey Dudes to work. And um, so it was a nice break, but like for me, I wanted to be out on the street. Yeah. But I took a year off and when I was getting ready to go back to the street, my daughter said, are you going back to being a street cop? And I said, yes. And she said, I don't want you to go do that. And I, and I asked her how come? And she said, because I don't want you to get killed or I don't want you to die. Yeah. And that one, I was like, fuck man. Like she's old enough to understand that this happened to me Mm -hmm. because my first shooting, she was so young. It didn't click for her, but the second one. Yeah. Like she was aware of it. Well, it went viral. I can and imagine it, yeah. her friends saw it and she saw it and everybody imagine. saw it. Yeah. So when she told me, I don't want you to go back because I don't want you to get hurt. I think as she said, I don't want you to get hurt. You know, I'm like, oh, damn. Yeah. I had a conversation with my son after the Uvalde police or active shooter thing because it was just everywhere. Right. And I had a pretty strong reaction to that. I was very upset and the more and more that i watch that and because in my mind like there's and i think and probably most police most people like there's no better way to die than running into a room to kill a monster who's actively assassinating and to wait children. outside and so i just couldn't even wrap my brain around how that was how what happened happened and um my wife and I were kind of talking about it and I was kind of getting fired up a little bit and my son could tell and he came over and he like gave me a hug and he was like, dad, did you know that sometimes kids die and, and they get, they get killed too. I'm like, and he was like four. I'm like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Yeah. I do. I do know that. I'm sorry that you do right now, but <laughs> it's an awful thing. Yeah. I, you know, mindset matters. I work with guys that are, I work with guys that are, 22, 23, 24 years old. And I work with guys that are, you know, 40 plus. Um, we I'm just 39. I don't know why you right, pointed right. over here, but uh, <laughs> I've just turned 40. Actually, that's a lie. I'm halfway <laughs> through 40. So um, I'm hoping I got that more I'm, gray hair than you do. I know. I'm hoping that like, I'm just still looking maybe like 36. <laughs> well, with me standing by, you look very right. young. We were doing active shooter training recently. And, and so I'm going to tag him here just in case he watches Jack, Jack Fetter. So he's a detective right now, but he's a SRT, uh, team leader. So I'm on, I'm on our SRT team too, but I run the drone program for it. So I'm the nerd on the team. Um, I'm not an operator on the team. I get to fly the drones. Um, Jack is a team leader. Um, so the SRT team's got two teams on it. Um, and he leads one of those teams and he put on in conjunction with a few other people, some active shooter training at one of the schools. Um, and he made it. He tried to make it as realistic as possible. And they had an active shooter running around the schools. They had actors, they had kids running around the schools. um, And one of the uh, cop was the shooter. And what he did though, is instead of like, all right, we're going to have 10 people show up here because that's bullshit. That's not how it happens, Mm -hmm. right? You're going to sit in your car. I will tell you when to go and I'm going to dispatch you to this. And you and that cop are the first two on scene. What are you doing? Right. That's kind of, you've all been trained on what to do. So let's put it to use and then, yeah. and then AAR it afterwards. Yeah. Um, so me and another guy, we roll up, he dispatches it. He says, all right, you guys are getting on scene. We make entry into the school. Um, we're moving towards, moving towards gunfire. Right. And, or, or following, following the stimulus, right. Body, body, blood, gun, you know, casings, gunshot. So we're moving through the school. Um, and we're running some munitions. So I got that stupid fucking paint mask on. I can't see anything. Um, and he tried to make it as realistic as possible. You get two people, but then he threw in the other component of that. Oh, guess what? Two more cops just got on scene and they're coming in through a different door, but you guys can't hear anything. You can't talk. You're not getting any communication on your radio because that's how it's really going to be. The sirens are going off. So all of a sudden we come around the corner and guess what? There's two more fucking cops pointing guns. And now we're screaming at each other until you realize they're cops. And then they're like, no, we just came in through the other door. That's the real world shit. So then you're linking up and moving to the shooter and Jack put together an incredible training where ultimately we end up engaging the suspect um, and then having to f- f- work through issues as you get a few more cops, a few more cops, a few more cops. And afterwards we talked about it and he's like, Hey dude, I just want to say, I really appreciate you like taking it super serious. Like you were clearly moving through it. Like I could see that you were, 
treating it like it yeah. was the real thing. And he's like, we had a lot of people come through here because it was multi-agency. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, anybody that could come. We had FBI agents going through it, HSI guys, um, multiple departments. And he said, a lot of people came through here and kind of fucked it off. Mm -hmm. Didn't treat it like it was serious. And I appreciate that. And I know that's a long way to say this, but my thought is, is I have a 13 year old daughter that's in junior high, getting ready to go into high school. Um, I don't want that fucking asshole who played games and fucked it off showing up. Yeah. I want me showing up yeah. or I want, I want people with that mentality showing up because if my daughter's in a school when that's happening, I want to know that it's a bunch of people like me that are going to show up, not a bunch of fucking lazy people who don't take that shit seriously. And so like Jack and I talked about that and he's like, it's just appalling to me how many people show up and they don't really take it serious. Especially after Uvalde. Right. Like, Punch that dude in the mouth. Yeah. And that's not to say, he said there were a few that didn't take it serious. I'm not trying to like knock Casper and say nobody took it serious, but yeah. there's always those people that are like, hey, I'll just. There are, there are. What I've found, most of the guys that are training adverse are the shittiest ones out there. They just don't want everyone to see how bad they suck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, you don't need get them it on the, the most, mats. man. They won't get on the mats. Nope. They, they won't, won't they shoot won't, at the range. They won't shoot at the range. Yep. They won't sit in a class. Right. We search and seizures. My big one. I teach for a company, the same company that Craig teaches for, mm -hmm. but I teach search and seizure, um, all over the place. You get cops that use search and seizure components, fourth amendment shit every single day, multiple times per day, mm -hmm. but you can't get them to sit in a seat to learn anything about it, to save their fucking life. Yeah. Right. And they won't shoot their guns. Their guns come out of their holster twice a year to qual. They won't spend a single second on the mat. Uh, I, I just, I don't understand that. I don't need, there's no place in that. They're also squatting for retirement. They're also waiting for their retirement. I <laughs> yeah. hear it all the time. That's those guys. Three more years uh -huh. and I'm done. Uh -huh. And we'll all be glad. So the next yeah. guy, maybe he'll come yeah, in and take fine. it seriously. Yeah. My thought is be done now then if, no if you hate it so bad. Yeah. I have the same conversation with a sergeant. Love the guy, but he was getting super shitty. And I said, take your stripes off then. Like, what is your, what do you, your, your job as a sergeant is to lead people mm -hmm. and you lead by example. Mm. right i'm not saying you have to be happy all the time but you don't get to create division yeah you don't get to divide the people that work for you you don't get to uh encourage mediocrity your job is to lead them and you lead them through through your actions yeah right and if you are so jaded and irritated and upset with this department that all you do is continue the problem then take your fucking stripes off and go back to being a regular officer because you don't deserve to be a sergeant if you lead poorly Agreed. And, you know, I, luckily he's like, I needed to hear that and I'm going to fix a few things. Right. And he, Good. But that's the hard truth. Mm -hmm. And that conversation can go two different ways. Hey, he could either be it's mad great about he, it or. Yeah. Could, yeah. It's great. Uh, but he's a good dude. Right. Yeah. Like, he's a great dude. He just, he just needed, needed a little, a little rain, a little, a little, a little pep. So I love it, man. But I think that's everything in life. Yeah. Jake, man, thank you for coming in. I enjoyed the hell out of this conversation. Yeah, I appreciate I you having me. I think that the audience will like it too. And if you guys are in Wyoming and need something filmed or right. yeah. <laughs> whatever, if you right. have any plugs for your business, your Instagram, whatever you've got, uh, please feel free to share it. Yeah, just, uh, well, 44 North Media and then um, Jake Bigelow Photo is kind of the secondary company. But. Nice, nice. So we're trying, we're growing as much as possible. Wyoming's pretty sporadic so keep up the grind man fuck retirement i, I agree i don't <laughs> want to retire i love it thanks guys stay zero i appreciate it man thanks man that was awesome